Welcome back to the MMA Museum Podcast. I'm Miguel Dorani. I am off camera because we have a very special guest. Guests, I do say too. Uh, <laughs> we are joined by Jay Jack and Amanda Buckner, a power couple in MMA. They fought a long time and uh, they've been together to, uh, from back then and they're still together, which makes them very unique. And, uh, and very, I'm very, very old. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm very psyched to catch up to them because um, I had a chance to work with both of them, and um, we did a tiny prep before the show, and they were always all business at the shows, and I could tell that they're ready to talk at this point. So, Jay, how you doing? I'm doing, man. I'm good, man. I'm good. How you doing? Good, good. And Amanda, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> you are. You always were. <laughs> always. Um, but uh, re really fast, um, uh, Jay, I think you're home, and at this point, home for you guys is Maine. Yep. And Amanda, you're back in the Colorado area, which is where your roots are, but you're doing like like a visit over there, which is why you're on separate screens. Is that correct? Yep. I'm out visiting a friend in Colorado. Okay, cool. So um, let's take it back to the beginning. Uh, the official databases have Jay debuting around 2000. And I guess I want to know if you guys, I, I think Jay may have some experience before that that we want to talk about, but... Talk about how you guys met and how the martial arts, you know, was probably, was that a part of how you met or, or did that come after? No, the how we met story is, is really one of those stories that's so insane that I, I'll give the shortened version of it just because it's, it's so convoluted, but I actually, um, Jay was already in Colorado and I moved to Colorado. Um, it must've been in, uh, I don't know. I don't know when it was like six, 97. 99. Oh, I thought it was a little later. 99, something uh, like that. 90, 97 I, or 98, something like that. Yeah. So I had been on a road trip um, for like a couple of months and drove through Boulder a couple of times and I loved it and wanted to live somewhere else other than Maine for a while. So I ended up moving back there and Jay actually hired me for my very first job in Colorado. Like I just, I was looking in the newspaper just at jobs and I kind of had a background in like psychology. And at the time Jay was working for a, what did, what did they call that? It was like, a, not yeah, it was a privately owned corrections company. Yeah. So these people would come in and we would have to give them like, they were, they were sent to the program, I think through the courts or something. So it was, it was and, the, it was the Boulder County work release. Day yeah. Program. So like we, we would got sit out there and it was, release, a, we had to keep track it was a tiny office. It was just he and I, and people would come in and we'd have to give them like some people would get an abuse and we'd have to like crush it up and watch them take it and then check their mouth to make sure they didn't throw it uh, like breathalyzers. We had to do breathalyzers. And then some people were on daily reporting where they had to come in every single day and they were on a schedule so that we could know where they were at any second. And if they said they were at the grocery store and we called and they weren't there, they would get, they could get put back in jail. So right. that's basically how we met is that Jay hired me um and <laughs> Jay, time, let, me, let me interrupt here for a quick second jay at that point in you know late 90s 97 98 you're, you're a young man how are you in law enforcement like what, what how'd you get there were you a a college football player or you know <laughs> no no man i grew up uh i grew up in a little bit of a criminal element um so like uh everything for me as a kid was just violence related you know uh so i spent a lot of time in jail as a juvenile uh so i was familiar with the the correction system and uh all the jobs i had as a kid like i bounced started bouncing in louisiana when i was 16 right because uh, you could drink at 18 back then so i started working at 16 and so like fighting and bouncing and doing security and shit like that was like the only thing i ever knew how to do uh and when i moved to colorado obviously i was bouncing in bars but then I saw an ad for a thing in a newspaper that was like privately owned corrections company and they didn't do back either. They didn't do background checks or they said like no experience necessary or something like that because like I was a seventh grade dropout. Um, so I couldn't really get like regular everyday jobs. Like my jobs were usually like, you know, flight oriented. Um, and so I went and applied for the job and they were like, basically you just have to not, get intimidated by people. And I was like, dude, that's not a problem. That's, that's, <laughs> you're in my wheelhouse, bro. We're good to go. 
uh, and I got a job there and it lasted for, I don't know, maybe, what, what do you think? Like six or seven months, something like that. Well, I don't think like, didn't you transition as far as job wise? Didn't it yeah, go I stopped, from that I stopped. to a mall's place? Yeah. Like, just you didn't have a job time. in between. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I was bouncing at that stupid jock bar, but like, yeah. but yeah. no, like no real jobs. I had that real job for a little bit. And that was the only, one of the only like real actual jobs I'd ever had. Well, um, and at that time you had not even started jujitsu. Like you didn't even know what it was at that point. No, like you, no, I you were a black belt in judo and you were still doing no. judo when I met you and you'd no. still go and do judo practices or whatever. Like you hadn't even met them all yet or even like tried jujitsu no. at that point. Yeah. Okay. When, when you say Amal, you're talking about Amal Easton, who I think his, his belt is from Henzo. Yep. So Amal yeah, Easton uh, was one of Henzo's early black belts, uh, and I was Amal's first black belt. Okay, okay. Uh, where, how do uh, you, you know? You said you came from you know a little bit of a troubled background and stuff, but you you had some uh, you had some judo in there. Where how? What was your early judo experience like? Because I mean, judo at the end of the day, Gene Labelle guys like that. You know, it can it can get it can get pretty dirty in there. Oh no, no no yeah and the the version of judo I learned was from a, a cop in in Florida and he was very like uh fight oriented in his judo so that was a good background for me. Man I started doing martial arts when I was a little kid like about 5 years old. Uh I started doing karate. Uh and because I was a little shitty kid and, and kept getting a lot of fights, I kept being faced with the idea that it didn't work like martial arts weren't real but i didn't really understand at the time that most of them were unrealistic i thought i was doing them badly so it made me double down and really train hard and so i was just like super dedicated little martial arts kid and that lasted from five to probably about 14 or so 14 15 and then i kind of that's when you hit your real bad period. Yeah, I was just in a lot of trouble, getting kicked out of school, going to That's jail. When you're doing much. a ton of drugs and drinking. A ton of drugs. It was it was a just really stereotypical bad path for a kid to go down, you know. And I was from a real white trash background, so it was like the martial arts thing was kind of a didn't really fit, and everybody was kind of hoping I would like take to it and get off the streets, and the streets just won a little bit. Like I just didn't, I didn't. Uh, I didn't make it. Um, well, thank God I, they they won they won the early battle, but not the war. That's good. That's yeah, man. <laughs> like when I was when I was I turned sixteen, locked up, and uh, it was one of those things where like uh, the DA was kind of out for me because I'd been in a lot of trouble, and they'd give me a lot of breaks, and and I'd blown all of them, and they literally were like, "We're going to give you enough rope to hang yourself," you know. So they gave me a suspended sentence, uh, made me go to treatment. And I did like six months in this facility and got out. And all I had to do was another six months because my, my charges were on suspension. It was a bunch of them. And they were like, at the end of this six month period, we're going to, uh, you'll be 17 by then. And uh, we'll close your juvenile file and you'll start your adult record clean, like fresh slate, clean start. But if I fuck it up, if I get arrested for anything, I'll get charged with that and all of the other charges, but they will charge me as an adult and I'll go to Angola. And so it was kind of like a do or die. This was it, you know? Uh, and I got out of my treatment facility and went to an A meeting and got high in the parking lot at my A meeting. And it was just like, that was the moment that I went, this is not me being like some tough this badass. Is this is me problem. being weak. Like, um, um, this is a weakness and I'm not okay with it. And so at that point, I really tried to turn my life around. Um, I got clean. Well, that's when you got straight edge. straight edge too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I got really into straight edge. Like I've, I've been clean for 30 years now, something like that. Uh, uh, that's amazing because, you know, I, I think you guys know me. I, I, I struggled with that, you know, so about seven years ago. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, yeah. It's, I'm proud of you for, for getting it early because, um, you know, it's that's a hard decision to make as a young man, especially when you got a lot of bad influences. Amanda, had, so you you walk in, you're looking for a job in Colorado. Obviously, Boulder has its uh, natural appeal and, and 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 stuff like that. So you get your job. How do you get into the martial arts? Did you come with a martial arts background? No, I came with no martial. I had never done a martial art in my entire life. Um, I was just I was an athlete since I was 
literally big enough to do sports. Um, the very first thing, like I have a photo, my mom put me in um, little league when little league baseball when I was a kid. I was the only girl in the entire league, of course. And like, there's a photo of me up to bat, and I was the same. The catcher and I were the same height, even though he was squatting down. Like that's how small I was. So that was kind of my start. And I did baseball, I did basketball, I did all that stuff, and that just kept up. And then I really took to basketball and I just fell in love with it. And I played that all through college. Um, and then when I graduated from college, basketball was obviously done. And I was kind of, I didn't really know what I was going to do with myself. I was kind of at a loss. Um, so I had no martial arts whatsoever. And my first introduction to it was I actually, I, so Jay got into uh, jujitsu and was really involved with Amal's school and he had had a couple of fights by then. And I stopped by just to visit with him. Like, I think he was teaching a class or something. And I stopped by just so we could, I think we were going to maybe have lunch or visit or something. And the second I saw jujitsu, I, I immediately was like, I have to do this. Like, this is, and I saw Jay's fights and, and it was a very immediate thing for me that I, I needed. It wasn't just jujitsu. It was a very immediate thing that I wanted to fight. And it was almost a little problematic because it was a little problematic. Yes. Yeah. It's because I wanted to fight so bad that it was like, it was very hard for him to, you know, keep me slowed down enough that I actually developed some skill first. Cause I was just very, very, uh, enthused about doing it. Um, Dude. yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. yeah. When she says I was a little enthusiastic, she's, yeah. she's okay. downplaying it a little bit. Right. Like she'd been training for what, like three months, something like that. And granted, tough as nails, tough as nails, like just genetically tough, a fucking determined fucking woman, like natural born fighter. Right. But but it's three months is three months. Man. I don't give a fuck how gifted you are. Three months is you're green. Right. And I had to deal with fucking family shit. I'd take my ex-wife, like go get a divorce and take her back to Louisiana. So I was gone for what, like three months, something like that. It was something like that. It was a couple months. months. It was a couple months, months. right? Couple months. I'm dealing with family bullshit across the country. I come back. (laughs) In this me, in this meantime, I am still training at a mall. Still training myself, trying to learn the skills of MMA. She's still training, still training, right? But undirected on like a mall was teaching her jujitsu and stuff, but like nobody was guiding her as a coach for a fucking MMA fighter, right? Like she wasn't on the radar of people fighting. And well, at that time, nobody was, I was the only one fighting. There was only a couple people fighting yeah. at the time. Yeah. Right? In our, in our, real... in our school, like it yeah. ended up being, it was like me, you and Cruz. We were the only ones at that yeah, time. For the, first, for the first couple of years, I was the only one fighting out of like that whole, that whole elevation fight team, the, you know, like that whole giant that monstrous so camp. Much. Like that was the yeah. first one that ever started fighting out of that, out of that area. Yeah. Anyway, I go back to town <laughs> after like three months and Mandy informs me that she's got a fight. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? And she goes, I've got a fight. And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking, I, what are you I talking booked, about? You have a I fight. I booked myself a fight. Bro. Yeah, I, I believe that. I I, I recently interviewed uh, another old school guy from down south, uh, Harry Moskowitz. Yeah. And uh, he preceded you by a, a couple of years. And his his entry into sport was he was a bouncer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the IVC did a show in uh, somewhere in Louisiana in like '96. Yep. Uh, he met the promoter on Wednesday and fought Saturday. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of underground fights or a lot of fights back in the day were like just super sketchy and shit. But so anyway, you, you had a few. You you had a few. For, let's let's take it back to the Wyoming stuff. You said you had a few sketchy fights yourself, and I want to know how much experience you had the first time you got in there. So by the time I had done an MMA fight, by the time I'd done an MMA proper fight or even a Valley Tudo fight, like I had done everything. I'd had, I'd had Thai boxing fights. I'd had boxing matches. I've done full contact karate. I've done judo competitions, like anything having to do anything with fighting. I did it. There was like the shit in the South called dog brothers where they do full contact stick fighting. I did that. Like everything that you can do related to fist fighting we did like early in the days of Jeet Kune Do, way back when, when we would do challenge fights and we would do like dojo fights. And like, I mean, I'd been fighting since I was a child in any form or another and on the street, just tons of fights. Right. 
And so like I had a bunch of experience practically, but none with with uh with grappling orientation outside of judo. I started judo in like 93 or 92, something like that. Um, so I had my my initiation to grappling in the in the early 90s. Um so by the time I got into Valley Tudo, it was I was already uh maybe like a early white belt in jiu-jitsu, I but I'd had a black were, belt. I thought you were a blue belt. Weren't you a blue belt by the time you fought? Mm. Which is still like that, you maybe know, blue not, belt. maybe. Maybe, but yeah, yeah, maybe, but yeah, but it was probably 98 ish, something like that. 98, 99. Oh, belt in 98 is was serious business, you know? Oh, no, yeah, yeah no, it's not like it is now. <laughs> no, no, no. Like back then, it was absurd. Back then, yeah. if you were a blue belt, you were a fucking wizard. Like it yeah. was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, uh, I did uh, some Valley Tudo stuff that wasn't uh on the record like wasn't on the records and didn't make it to the databases and shit like that um but yeah so i'd had a bunch of experience by the time it went into mma i remember in like maybe 99 i was on a show in in denver in the ring of fire and it was the first time the athletic commission had ever gotten involved in colorado and they were backstage the night of the fight telling us we had to wear gloves and telling us we couldn't headbutt and making it like some crazy absurd, like three minute rounds or something. And it was like, the place was going nuts and everybody was freaking out, but they wanted the fight. They wanted the show to go on. Right. So like, I remember putting on gloves and God, there was some guy, there was this guy that was famous in Japan as a ref. I think his name was Obaki. Remember that guy? Uh, uh, Tim Catalfo. Yeah. 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 That guy. Right. So he was the ref with his fucking crazy beard and shit. And, uh, and I remember Seneca was in my corner with them all. And, uh, Seneca was like, we'd never had gloves on. you in Portuguese and you're like, he didn't even know English, right? He's screaming at me in Portuguese, right? I don't fucking speak Portuguese. Amal does, but he's having to translate. And so I've got these gloves on for the first time ever. And Seneca's like, man, bite your glove, bite your glove. (laughs) And I get my arm around the kid's neck and he's holding my glove. So I can't get my other hand out to choke. And I bite my glove and I'm starting to pull on my glove with my mouth so I can choke him. And fucking Obaki starts hitting me in the head. He's like, no biting, no biting. <laughs> like, it's my fucking glove, man. Leave me alone. It's my glove. So, yeah. I mean, that was the early days, man, where it was like. Right when like the bite, athletic commissions were actually, it was starting to become a real thing because yeah. like athletic commissions were getting involved and it was becoming. I mean, dude, that was back when it was like, we didn't really even know what we were going to call it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we opened our gym here in Maine in 2003. And like we people were it, calling it no holds barred still. Back yeah, then. we called it, we called it the Academy of Mixed Martial Arts because we were being like cool double entendre like we wanted to say like this is an eclectic martial arts school we teach predominantly jiu-jitsu but we're you know we we are eclectic we mix a bunch of martial arts together we didn't even know at the time that was going to turn out to be the name of the fucking sport you know yeah. what I mean? back then it was like nhb or are we calling it valley tudo or are we calling it yeah. NBA, are we calling it extreme fighting like what the fuck are we calling it so like yeah we it was it was a lot of the fights back then were still super sketchy i remember we would go to shows and find out kind of what the differentiation and rules was yeah. backstage. Like they're, while they're talking, you're like, what, what dude, one time in, in Atlantic city, Mandy had a fight and I don't even remember how round, how many rounds it was scheduled for. But oh we yeah. Jesus. Gloves off. It was, it was That's Basler. That. I think it was fighting Basler, Shana Basler. And we're taking her gloves off the and second, they walk, the they walk back to the corner and they go, there's an overtime round. <laughs> and oh, we're like, what? Was that me? <laughs> overtime round all right sweet yeah. Yeah. that was so miserable because that already was like that was a hard fight and yeah. it, i was so tired and like when they said that oh my god i was so Dude, that I, was the day that i think i really completely fell in love with you though oh god i really think <laughs> really it was because like everybody talks a lot of shit everybody talks a lot of shit about what they would do and what they wish they would do and she came back to the corner and, and it had been a I very, was all blo- I was like, oh, no, 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 like Shana she put you in the fucking in the tie like clinch, times. Yeah. need you in the face, like 20 times unanswered. Your My face nose was just smashed like... in, just smashed it. Right. Just bleeding everywhere. Yeah. Comes back to the corner, all fucking mad. Like that, you know, I wish I could go back out there. You know, like I'm not done yet. Fuck. I want more. 
but everybody talks that shit. Everybody says that shit when it's over and there's no chance of them going back. Like everybody's a tough guy. When the bouncer starts pulling you away, you're like, you're lucky this motherfucker pulled me off, you know? Yeah. So they walked up and said overtime round. Which also meant that that round was going to decide the fight because that meant we were tied. So it was like, yeah. Yep. And I just, I remember thinking, I think I even said to you, like, now we get to see who you are. Like, this yeah, is what I think we get to see. A hundred percent. I know yeah. I said. Yeah. I was like, dude, now we get to see who you are. Because everybody can fight when it's comfortable and cool and you're pumped up, but your face is fucked up and you already started taking your gloves off and you thought you were done. So now we get to see who you are. And that bitch just walked out there and <laughs> finished her and just yeah. smashed her. And I was, ex- I was like, I think I'm going to ask you to marry me. <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited. Yeah, that, that that's, was... that, that, that's cool to hear. And I, I remember that about Amanda when she competed was that uh that instinct that she she was very much a natural and very much I thought she had the uh widest range of skill set of, of yeah. all the women. Like Jennifer Howe was heavy handed and, mm. and Tara had her ground game and stuff like that. And her, her, punching came along but i thought amanda was the most rounded at the time but but we were talking about jay coming home after three months and amanda's got a fight book (laughs) so she had it so she has she tells me she tells me when i get home she's like i have a fight book and i was like what the fuck do you mean you have a fight book and so i can't remember who it was man i mean that was no 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 no. i can't remember no no no. i know who it was i can't i can't remember the promoter yeah it was crazy that it got booked because i was it was clearly the promoter was fucking her over you know what i mean like clearly it was a lamb to the slaughter kind of thing because i come back and i was like not necessarily opposed but like uh, i'm pretty sure it was i'm pretty sure i booked it with judy neff that's what you told you were like it's judy (laughs) neff i don't know who she is but i think at the time was like number 12 and (laughs) oh like coaching midwest wrestling in college somewhere like just fucking jacked right like just crazy i was like okay she said yeah you want to hear a funny Judy Neff story is she fought on hook and shoot, I think on the first hook and shoot. Mm. And I walked into her hotel room and I don't know if you know Roger, her, her yeah. husband. Yeah. yeah. He had him on her back and she was doing squats. Yes. <laughs> crazy. She was a gigantic. Monster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> monster. So Mandy's like, yeah, I got this fight with some girl named Judy Neff. And I knew I was like, no, fuck that. Like that at the time, Judy was the, 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 the undefeated killer. You know what yeah. I mean? And I was like, no fucking way. And I called the promoter and I gave the promoter shit because I was like, listen, man. Because he was like, there's no way you're pulling her out. It's it's like, oh, man, you're leaving me high and dry. It's only a couple weeks away. And I was like, bro, you are unethical. Like, you should not have booked that. You're lucky that somebody fucking found out. Like, come on, man. Like, don't like somebody is involved that knows the game now. So you can fuck off. Like, this is absurd. You should not have booked this fight. You're a fucking dick. Right. <laughs> so I pulled her from the fight. I was so mad. Oh, you were so mad at me. So mad at me. But then you were like, but you kind of had a, you made it a little bit better because then you were like, look, if you can do, you know, I started sparring um, with those couple of kickboxers and you were also like, we're going to do these grappling competitions and we'll see how you do with that. Miguel, listen, I was like, okay, bro. I'm not putting her off. Like I never not took her seriously. I never blew her off and I never didn't take her seriously. But I honestly thought I was putting some, some speed bumps in her way to slow her down so she would get the proper experience so she would be able to develop into what she was supposed to develop and not just get crushed out early you know and i also didn't i had never seen her fight and i had never seen anything and i knew she didn't have a fighting background like she came from a decent childhood and a regular sports background and i grew up getting the fucking shit beat out of me so like i didn't expect her to take to it as naturally as she did you know what i mean because her background was not indicative of somebody that would fucking be good in the shit. And so like, I was like, listen, let's get you, let's get you some sparring. Let's get you some competitions, blah, 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 blah. And she was like, whatever you need me to do, I'm going to fucking do it. Cause I'm doing this. I'm fighting. And I was like, all right, cool. And there weren't very many grappling competitions back then. So what I did was I, we saw the very first grapplers quest West quest, yeah. in Las Vegas, the very first one. And so we took a team of people from a mall school down there. I was Broke like, there. okay. I said, yeah, we drove down there. I was like, all right, so here's the deal. We're going to take you to a jujitsu tournament. And like, if you do okay, comp- if I see how you compete and I, you keep your head together, then maybe we'll talk about booking you a fight. But I'm not going to watch you do an MMA fight if you can't even handle the stress of a jujitsu competition. 
And so I took her to this jujitsu competition to like give her a little bit of a reality check as to what her level was so we could like get some training in and get her prepared. There's nobody beginner. There's no beginners. Yeah. No beginners whatsoever. Yeah. So I showed up in my division included. The expert Judy division. Neff. It was Judy Neff, <laughs> Jen Howe. Uh, wasn't Jen there? It was oh, Jen. I don't, know. I don't know if she was there. It was, fuck, it was big names. It was Judy Neff. What was that girl they used to call Grapple Girl? Uh, what was her actual name though? Michelle something? Um, oh, God. I don't remember, but she, she fought for a while. Um, there were some other people. Now I can't I remember, but like, every yeah. single girl there was damn a prof. A there, prof there was at least there was at high least level three girls in the division that were in the MMA scene and were already fighting. Like and like literally the girl we just pulled her out of the fight of Judy Neff was there. Yeah. Like so all these monster girls, and I was like, well, it's a bummer because we drove all the way here and there's nobody in your division, but you should at least get in there and feel what these girls feel like. And I honestly didn't expect her to do that well, but I thought it was going to be a learning experience or whatever. So Mandy goes and wins the fucking tournament. <laughs> yeah. And I was Michelle like, Farrow? was that Michelle Farrow? Michelle Farrow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So Mandy goes and wins the tournament. Now, even this, it, this is kind of dramatic. It comes down to her and Judy Neff in the finals. Right. And this is the girl I just pulled her out of the fight of. Right. So there was a little bit of backstory to it. Right. And it goes the distance. And there was like at the last second, Mandy swept her like they were even up on points, very low scoring match. It was very even Mandy swept her or something, but they were protesting the rules. It was like, she wasn't in guard when she swept her, but they gave her points and whatever. And Judy freaked out and it was this whole thing. And everybody's mad throwing bottles. It was this goddamn kerfuffle. <laughs> and then, you know, the judges ruled it for Mandy and it was like a very close fight, a very close match. Uh, and Mandy wins the fucking tournament. And at that point, I was like, fuck, man. Like, she's... I don't know, like, do you want him to stop swearing so much? Because really, like, that it's no. such a part of... <laughs> no, I really don't. Ask ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta no, talk no, about no, that. That's, that's cool of you to ask and stuff, but no, no, let's just... Okay. <laughs> yeah, she's, the one, she's the one that does the professional stuff. Yeah. But yeah, so like, she wins the whole tournament, and at that point, I was like, she's different, and this is going to go on a much faster timeline than I would have expected. And so we really, at that point, put both of our attention kind of full time on her, like getting as far as she could get, you know, like making it a profession. Cause I mean, like she's was definitely gifted. And at that time there was just the caliber of women at, at the time, like now the level is starting is high enough that it's like, if you transported most of the female fighters from back then to the modern era, there would be like no survival, you know, but the Mandy was one of the first girls that was fighting in what looks like modern mixed MMA. Like she had a full skill set, like an athlete, yeah. a full set of skills and all the disciplines. Right. And it was like, it was a special thing to see. And we, I, I knew at that point that, you know, she was different. You know? Yeah, people people get sensitive nowadays, but I I thought the best way to sum it up is a lot of times when Amanda like when Amanda had the right opponent like Tara or someone like that, it yeah. wasn't girl fighting anymore or ladies fighting anymore. Yeah. It was just yeah. fighting, and and fighting. that was a transcendent moment for for what they did. I I, I think that's a a compliment. If you know, even if other people might not take it that way, it totally is. Yeah. Well, it's 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 <clears throat> it's it's a compliment in the sense that it is a good thing that you're saying it's only insulting in the sense that people imagine people, it shouldn't be a shock. It's like yeah. the old joke when, you know, who is the, the black policy, like a uh, uh, Barack Obama, when people are like, Oh, he speaks so well. That's like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he does speak well, but like, you shouldn't be surprised, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like it's only insulting that people are surprised when they see it. But that honestly I feel like a lot of that comes down to coaching. I yeah. think that a lot of like, I think women have the potential, the same potential as it doesn't, who gives a fuck if you have an innie or an Audi, like everybody has the same arms and legs. Motherfuckers can move the same way. So it's like, uh, I think it comes down to coaching. I think when a, a coach sees a male prospect doing pretty good, they go, you can have more than that. You owe me more than that. Like there's more than that in you do better. Keep your hand up, do better. When they see a girl at that same level, they're like, nice. And they get satisfied. 
Well, I think that was also, I think that was specific to that time period a little bit, because I think that's one of the things that has changed now. It's gotten better for sure. That are starting now and are are modern is that I think, I think they go in and gyms take them more seriously right off the bat. And um, I think way back then there, it definitely was a thing where, you know, if some of the women like did anything well at all it's like everybody was so impressed and almost like surprised yes. you know but it that was that was a big difference and it and i think it was a lot um i think not as much was it expected of the women maybe by their coaches or whatever so they weren't pushed as hard uh well, and I, I I think was, too, I, i'm sorry to interrupt i think too oh, you do have to take into account that uh the pioneer set yourself and and the girls prior to you took it to to such a level that it became that that there yes. was no longer you didn't no longer had to have a gimmick or like oh the chicks are gonna fight or whatever it right. is because you could put on a professional looking match and that's you know another compliment it's like you guys did uh pick the level up very quickly and 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 the truth is is almost like to every single one of you wanted to be taken seriously in one way or another. You know, there was a very good uh like set of pioneers there, like paying paying dues for everything. At yeah. one point I actually had an argument where I put Amanda on a top 10 pound for pound list because I really did respect her skill set that much. And I think yeah. it, that that list is about an eclectic and mixed up skill set. And I, I said you could argue her after whoever was, you know, the immediate guys, she's the only woman I'd put on there, even though she, you know, she took losses to some of the others or, you know, or whatever. I always thought that uh, she was the most complete. So uh, my hat's off to you guys and my hat's off to all your opponents. So, but let's take it back to this uh, Judy Neff stuff because eventually Jay's going to approve, uh, approve you fighting. Yes. Yeah. Eventually I did get a, I did get a fight. We did. we did. We got her a fight. God, it was, it wasn't even, I don't even think it was Ring of Fire, was it? No, it was that one. It was that, I don't really... even know what town it was in, but it was in that church. That it was church. Like a, a church auditorium. It was like a church compound and it was like their gym and they set up a ring in the middle of the gym yeah. and yeah. they were trying to make me the main event. Dude, Remember it was. It was I so, hadn't even done anything yet. They, they, wanted, they like, were trying to use away. it as a gimmick. They wanted her to be like the main event. And I don't remember who you fought, but like who was that was, girl? Uh, I don't remember her name, but she had like, for something. Fights. Okay, I got, I got some, I got the details here. So we're talking about the Rocky Mountain Slammer. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes, I didn't even remember the name of it. Uh, yeah, Cannon okay. City, and uh, that's uh, Colorado. Yeah. Um, you yeah. fought Jennifer Palmer. Jennifer, right? Yeah, I knew it was Jennifer something. Yeah, and it was it was a quick fight. It only lasted about. The, but the girl, the girl was much bigger than you, and oh, had yeah. a had a bunch of fights. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the time it was like we we had to take for Mandy. We had to take fights that were not necessarily ideal, but you couldn't do that back then. You know what I mean? With women, especially, it was like there was just no fights available. So you took what you can get. If it was a weight class up, if it was an experience differential, if it was like a stylistic thing that wasn't really good for where you're at right now, you couldn't do the like, let's make a plan. Let's take a couple fights and then go to that guy. Like you couldn't yeah, do that. You shit. just you had to be willing to do whatever. And the crazy thing, I don't even know, like outside of you and, you know, maybe a couple other people. One of the craziest things about that fight that most people don't even know is and I was so amped to fight, like I wasn't going to miss the opportunity, but I did that fight. I was two weeks into radiation from cancer. <laughs> like, like a six week I, radiation treatment. Yeah, I was weeks. doing six weeks of radiation and I had just finished two weeks and that the fight was like on a weekend. So yeah. I finished two weeks and then the fight I think was on a Saturday or something. Yeah. And I... I just wasn't going to miss the fight because of it, but it, it was crazy to think now like that. It's kind of ridiculous to to have done that. That's, that's dedication, and that's you know, a cancer survivors that return to compete in sports and said whatever the cancer was, it's still notable. So um, you had just gotten your stitches out from the surgery right before the fight. Yeah, it wasn't that long. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. now let me let me ask a quick question here because. This database has this Jennifer uh, Palmer fight, but it was 
A week later, you fought Tara Ray, and that was like an amateur fight. What is that accurate, or are the dates off here? No, I don't even know that name because my second fight was against uh, Christine Van. Uh, Christine Van, Van Fleet. Fleet? Yeah. Okay, no, no, no. What did you fight like a, a year ago? No, no, I haven't right. fought in forever. A pro exhibition against Tara Ray in May of 2022. That's why it was May of 2020. Oh. So they got oh, they must... know. are they are they talking are they putting the uh the the uh fight to win the jujitsu match fight quest five oh no that's no. they got that wrong yeah like okay. a year a couple a couple years back she did a both her and I did a kind of coming out of retirement pro jujitsu match but okay. like that wasn't no fighting yeah okay it wasn't, it wasn't okay so yeah that uh, we're clearing up we're Sure, dog's database here fixing yeah. that for. <laughs> so I and I know Christine Van Fleet. She's uh, oddly enough, you know, uh, there was another power couple in MMA. Yeah, and on that card, like I think they both fought on that card as well. Yeah, so yeah. that was kind of cool. So Jay, were you in her corner for that? Obviously, in Amanda's oh, yeah. corner. Oh yeah. yeah, he was in my corner yeah. for every fight. I was in. Yeah, I I cornered her for every fight. I was there from the beginning of her career. I cornered her for every fight. She cornered me after. Once uh, I started up. Yeah, once I can't remember. I, it was uh the fight that you went backstage and and hung out and watched and but we weren't cornering but we're backstage was a uh, gladiator challenge. Oh, against that guy. Uh, I can't remember his name. I don't remember. But, yeah, it was gladiator challenge at some. Uh, yeah. Rocky Mountain something or other was the name of the show. It's Gladiator Challenge. Anyway, whatever. It's on the record somewhere. It's Mark, Mark Mankveld. Yeah, Mankveld. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, like, she saw that. She was backstage for that fight. And after that, she was, she cornered for every fight I had after. Then I cornered. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So now, did you, uh, anyone ever talk about matching up with Steve J? Because uh, Steve is Steve Van Fleet, Chris is uh, we, we talked about it that night. We were like, why aren't we fighting? This could yeah. have been like, the shtick, yeah, right? That yeah. night, we talked about trying to get somebody to put on a show that was just people that, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. couples, right? Yeah. Because uh, at the time, Jen Howe and, uh, and Jeremy Moore were a thing. Uh, the Judy Van Neff Fleet. and Roger. Judy Neff, Roger Neff. Neff. Although, although, everybody, like, I mean, I'd have done it because I'd I'll do I I would have done anything back then, and I fought like no weight classes before, but like she Rogers, yeah, big. Roger enough was like ginormous. <laughs> He's big, though. He's yeah. Big. yeah, so yeah, that probably wouldn't have worked out, but uh, but yeah, most of us were in a size range. We probably could have pulled it off, except for Roger. Yeah, my my hats off to the Van Fleets because you know just I they were cool people. They <laughs> both were really them. really nice. Christine was very very nice. Like I I really enjoyed meeting her for sure. Yep. So uh so Jay we're progressing. Did you guys uh, I'm going to ask two off to the side questions before we keep going through some fights. Uh did you guys ever find the same show together? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll get yeah. to that in a minute in a minute. And Amanda I was going to ask you cuz we were talking about fight stability and and how many fights do you figure that you got canceled on you? Like showed up, the opponent show up, or, you know, last minute cancellations or whatever. Was there a bunch of that? Yeah, there, it was, it was very hard for me to, um, at a certain point it became very hard for me to find fights. Um, so we would get a lot of that. It was either difficult to find a fight or I would get an opponent and something would happen, um, you know, and they'd have to pull out and it was just, it was always one of those, uh, one of those things. So that did happen a lot. Okay. Now let me, uh, let me go back here. So now Jay, you, you got, happened to me you, a lot too. Yeah. I, I was going to say you, you got a straight run through 2000, 2001 where the database picks up. Yeah. We get to that Mark Menfeld fight. Um, you you only took one loss to, to a guy named Pete Spratt that everybody knows. Yeah, um, and then you took like a year off. So, but talk about that whole winning streak. You beat Cruz Chacon and a couple of good guys in there. Yeah, 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 no, it was it was really good. Um, and Cruz, Cruz became our training partner and really, really good, good friend, friend after yeah. that fight. Yeah, yep. a lot of a lot of people we fought we wound up being kind of close with afterwards. You know, yeah, um, you and Hal became really good friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I had a, a, a pretty good streak uh, that went for a while. Uh, and it was really interesting because like 
<clears throat> the sport was kind of evolving around me and I was very uh, unprepared for the direction that it was going because when I first started, it was still very, I mean, it was illegal everywhere. Like you didn't really talk about it. It wasn't on the radio. Nobody's making posters. Like fights were like a rave. Like a lot of people went, but you had to know about it and it's not public knowledge. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so like, it felt right for me. Like I grew up kind of just poor white trash and like fighting. I was accustomed to, we were like the opposites for each other. Right. Like for I me, was used fighting, to regular sports and competition. Yeah. Fighting and violence was where my headspace was comfortable. Athletics was not a comfortable place for me. Like the idea of being an, like, it was really uncomfortable for me when people would refer to me as an athlete. I was always like, what? Like in my head, I'm a, I'm a, I fight. But like, uh, I didn't view myself as a, as an athletic sports person. I thought of myself as like a murderer, you know, not like a, not a athlete. Right. And for her, she was an athlete her whole life. It's like, I was a fighter that had to learn how to do the sport. And she was a sports person that had to learn how to fight, you know? And so like, we were literally opposite parts of the spectrum, but for me, it was really weird because the more it got professional, and like a pro athlete vibe, the more like weird and uncomfortable I was with the whole concept. And the more they changed the rules, the worse it was for me. Um, Cause yeah, man, you, if you, did, you did worse you, and worse. Like the more it became, you know, like a, a man, sport competition or whatever, well, the it's more like, you struggled with it because it started to get like, that's also when we got into like kind of sports psychology, sports psychology. Stuff because that's when you started to struggle the most with that yeah. aspect of it. When the, the more it became like a, a it's like, it's like, if you, it, I mean, I have pretty good confidence, right? Like I've been fighting my whole life and I'm fairly tough. If you lock me in a fucking room with somebody and the, the parameters are, you come back and check every couple of days and one of us is dead. Like I win that more often than I lose it. You know what I mean? Like I'm a, I, I can, endure ridiculously bad beatings and you'll get tired of beating on me. And when you get tired of beating on me, I'm gonna chug the shit out of you. You know what I mean? Like that old school jujitsu, just grind them out, endure it. They make a mistake. You capitalize. Like that's my happy place. Right. Which is weird. Cause that scares people now because they're like, you could fight for two hours. And I'm like, yeah, but it's like, it's not the pace. Once they put a time limit on, it, I remember the first time they said it's a 30 minute fight, like one 30 minute round. It scared me. Because I was like, there's a time limit, which means now there's, it's a workload question. It's not a who lives. It's a who gets the most done in X amount of time. And yeah. that was like, that sounds like a, a, a an athletic contest. And that freaks me out. Like, I'm not used to that. That freaks me out. And then they kept dropping the times down. The next fight was like a 15 minute round and a 10 minute overtime. And then the next one, they were like five minute rounds and sometimes four minute rounds back then. And every time they kept chopping it down, I saw getting further and further away from who kills who and closer and closer to who can perform the most work volume in a set time frame, like a CrossFit competition. And I've never viewed myself as an athlete and explosive athletics was not my strong suit. And I, it really shook me the more the sport went that way the more i was like kind of a dinosaur trying to catch up and i had to really i mean mandy helped me with this a ton but i had to really get into the idea of sports psychology because i was really trying to all the shit she learned as a kid about sports psychology i was brand new to and had to like start training like an athlete and learning how to believe in my athleticism and 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 the whole thing it's like weight classes too like back then there was no weight classes and then it was under 200 and i was fine People don't even remember that now or like mm -hmm. don't even realize it like mma fans now it's like i don't mm -hmm. even know if they remember like it was every show had different times for the rounds it was totally yeah, yeah. It's different rules different times diff yeah. i like mean it was different just gloves for your opponent like your opponent yeah. shows up with different gloves or you know oh, yep. yeah dude we oh, used to remember we used, fair we used to be able to bring that was what's so crazy and i was so disappointed when this changed oh. we used to be able to bring your own gear yeah which was crazy so you, i had these gloves that jay got me that they were fair mma gloves and oh. they were literally 
the hardest thing you have ever felt in your life. There was, it was almost just like there was a piece of leather. It was, it was, was like, like four, ounce, of four ounces of padding in the wrist and then just a flap of leather. And I <laughs> loved them. And I just, I brought them to every single fight. And I was so oh. disappointed when they eventually made you start using the, the promotions gear because those oh. gloves were just amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, just just really fast to share a, kind of a parallel experience, Jay. It's like back in the old days, too. It's like, all right, you guys, the spiders figured out, you know, there's some promoters you can trust, some you can't trust. But everybody was more or less, you, you, you operated on your word. It's like when it, when it got jam-packed with lawyers and contracts and stuff, I checked out too, man. <laughs> Dude, I remember the first time. I remember, God, I can't remember what show it was, but they wanted to pay us with a check. And I remember like a bunch of people backstage were like, a what? What are you yeah. talking about? I'm sorry. What'd you say? A fucking check? No, dude. No. Give me cash. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was, no. I remember the first time. I think it was, uh, I think it was that Van Fleet fight. It was at the Pepsi center and they made us fill out W2s. And I was like, oh, oh that you're, gosh. you're confusing that. Uh, that one was not at the Pepsi center. That one was at the place. The rodeo. That had a bunch of cow shit. Like so, it right. was, that was the rodeo. Was, yeah, there was like cow and horse shit everywhere, like because it was in it was in a building that was used as like yeah. horse competitions or something yeah. like that. Yeah, there was it was where they have rodeos. We warmed yeah. up in a horse stall. I forgot. Yeah, about in that. a horse stall. Yep. Yeah, we we, did, we actually did one hook and shoot in Wichita Falls, Texas, in a rodeo with like you know yeah. dirt, dirt. We had dirt to put floor. that to walk up yep. to the ring and stuff. Yeah. So um, so okay, so and. Jay, you you come to talk about the Pete Sprat fight because that might be the first, uh, maybe the first time that there's a guy that, that's kind of like on the national level or, or uh, of your opponents and stuff. So, so all experience. I, I saw him. He and I were in an eight man tournament before that, right? And we everybody assumed. Uh, that it was going to come down to me and him in the finals based on the people that were in it. I mean, not, I'm not talking shit about anybody, but that was just kind of like the talk. Right. And it was kind of like uh, they kind of did it back then. You remember how everybody was kind of having that striker versus grappler lean sure. to, right. So they had me and Gabe Garcia who were very known or like known for our jujitsu. And they had uh, Cruz Chacon and Pete Spratt who were both kickboxers. And I had beaten uh, Gabe once before somewhere else uh, in another show and that was a rematch for him and everybody kind of assumed that pete was gonna beat uh cruz and so we had an eight-man thing and cruz you know upset everybody upset the the thing and beat pete and so me and cruz fought in the finals for that thing so i beat cruz and then that set up a thing for pete to come back out and me and him fight so i'd seen him fight before and i knew he was a good kickboxer i knew i was like i knew he was a gnarly kickboxer like fucking hits really goddamn hard so hard dude mm -hmm. so yeah hard, well, i mean and that was the thing that happened like you got stunned like by a, a really hard punch and you just i think you probably hadn't had that experience uh, i remember i previous remember to that you i don't think you had gotten hit that hard and i think it was just one of those things where you didn't have that ingrained instinct you know what this I mean? Is, Go forward with that. This is what happened, fight. right? I remember that fight. Like, this is what happened. And thank God it was before. Well, not thank God. It was before you could watch your fights backstage because you watch it on somebody's phone. Mm -hmm. It was before that. You had to wait weeks to get to see the fight. And that's good because you don't have the embarrassment of like it's the you watch it on Facebook that night while everybody's like, oh, shit, you got fucked up. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have to deal with that shit. But the bad thing was you could talk shit for weeks about how you thought it went before you saw the video and went, oh, that's not at all what happened. Yeah. Fuck, right? So what happened to me was I came out uh, and it was the first time uh, it wasn't the first time I'd fought in gloves, but it was the first time anybody had uh, been wrapping their hands. Right. Uh, because the first time we were in gloves was that eight man tournament and they gave us the gloves backstage. So nobody back then was wrapping their hands. It was bare knuckle. And so like, I'd never been hit by taped hands in four ounce gloves. Right. And the whole concept in jujitsu is too far too close and they might be able to touch you, but they're not going to be able to do much damage because you're in too close. And so I get on a single leg and put him against the, uh, it was ropes, put him against the ropes and he goes like this. 
know, 30, 40 times. And in my brain, like after three or four, they either lighten up or stop doing it because they're going to break their fucking hands. And that is not the case when somebody has taped hands, you know, and this guy's fucking strong. <laughs> And he started just jackhammering my head while I'm on a single. And I remember like my lips started going numb. And I was like, this is bad. You were getting, you were getting. I was like, this is bad. Like, this is not my whole life. People, they, they fuck their hands up before they keep going. Right. And so I was like, I got to go. And it made me rush. It made me a little rushy. So like I dumped him past his guard, got to side control. But instead of like settling in and like being secure, tried to go too fast. immediately popped up and tried to go to the mount. And he just like scrambled out from under me, jumps up and he throws like a couple punches. And I, what I remembered was backing up in a turtle and hitting my back against the ropes and thinking in my head, this is what I thought happened in my head. I was like, okay, I'm covering up and I'm going to shoot. Like I'm going to cover up and then I'm going to shoot. And I remembered changing my level and shooting and then the ref stepping in and I was like, what the fuck are you doing? And he was like, you're out. And I was like, I'm shooting. And I was all upset. And on the video, I, I'm never disrespectful, but you can see me like containing the, I didn't lose face or whatever. And I remember for about a week telling people I was trying to shoot and the ref stopped it and he stopped it fucking early and he shouldn't have done it. And then a week later, I get the videotape back. And, and what actually shooting. happened, what <laughs> actually happened was I'm turtling and I'm backing away. My back hits the fence. He clips me with an uppercut, which completely dumps me, but yeah. it was ropes. So I fell backwards and my ass hit the middle rope and propelled me forwards onto my face. So that's why I saw him getting closer. My <laughs> brain confabulated that into I shot, but I didn't. Yeah, and I just, you got and I'm just, and then no, just, I got knocked the fuck out. I'm laying on my face. You weren't yeah. unconscious, but you were, you were like, no, I was like Bambi legged, yeah. right? The ref comes up to me and I'm just like wobbly. <laughs> and then I finally pick my head up after a couple of seconds. And then you see me go, come on, <laughs> yeah. <are> <laughs> which is terrible. So yeah, I, yeah, but that was a, I wasn't expecting how much sustained concussive trauma you can get in tight positions because of the tape. My brain was just not, it changed. Once they started taping the hands, it changed the theory. It used to be a different theory. And now with taped hands, volume of punches without caution, like reckless abandoned volume of punches. Because you weren't going to break your hands. Is anymore. now the norm. Yeah. And that changed the game. It was kind of like when wrestling came in, wrestling changed the game. Like when, like people realize the power of jujitsu that changed the game. There were all these like ev ev evolutions and jujitsu woke everybody up to jujitsu. Then wrestling came on and made everybody realize wrestling and then tape and gloves made the, the, the volume of punches change. And that changes the theory because things are different with volume as punching, you know? Yep. Yeah. For sure. And the time you could add the time limits that we talked about to that list of things that changed essentially the fight. You know? I mean, it wouldn't have helped me in that fight, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, especially yeah. if you're a grappler, it's like you yeah, you got less and less time to make something happen, you know, and especially like as you start fighting people that are you close in skill level, like it's really hard to finish somebody that, you know, when you're close in skill, it's hard to finish somebody in five minutes, you know, like it's it it made it harder if you were really into like the grappling part, you know. I was talking to Jeremy Horn about it and he mentioned the volume punching that Jay mentioned too, but he said that what he sees is that really the technique is bad. That a lot, it turns out that a lot of the time now people are volume punching just for the show and not really applying real good technique. A lot of sloppy punches where, you know, they're hitting with the wrong side of the fist or the back, you know, whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you guys... I think also with Amal and, and the back, that background, we're very technical. Yeah. Yeah, we were. I mean, I, mean I, I felt, I felt very lucky. I actually felt like it was, um, I felt very fortunate that I actually started from scratch. Um, I think the fact that I was such a blank slate and had never done anything really worked, end up, ended up working to my advantage because I learned everything correctly the first time through. I didn't have any bad habits to break. So I think it made it easier for me to learn how to be technically correct. Yeah. Yeah. You were now, well did from the start. But, now, it, but it's because I was having to learn all of the things. Like, well, like I, I think the first time you learned how to shoot, you learned how to shoot 
in the context of MMA. Of fighting. Like, yeah. I hired a wrestling coach because wrestlers came on the scene and everybody started wrestling. I was like, fuck, man, we got to get this. We got to get some of this. And I had to go to a high school. And I went to Boulder High and like found the wrestling coach and tried to convince him that I wasn't a crazy person. I'm like, I fight in a cage for money. I need to learn wrestling. And he's like, what are you doing at my high school, you adult? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it was, it, 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 I had to learn wrestling and it took me a week to convince him to let me wrestle with my left leg forward because I'm like, I don't fight with my right leg forward. And it's like, that was just so foreign. But when you started wrestling, it was already in the idea of wrestling for MMA. Right. Everything, didn't have to, like, everything I learned it. was from that, from that standpoint. Like, even though I love jujitsu, I, I wasn't focusing on developing a game for that. I was focusing on making my jujitsu for MMA and mm -hmm. making everything for MMA right from the beginning. I'm going to grab okay. another blanket for the dog. He's digging around in the books. I'm going to grab a blanket real quick. Okay. Take care of that doggy. So let, let me uh, surmise something here. So Jay had been actively fighting right through 2001. We talked about he had a nice streak going. And he took all 2002 off, which is when you made your debut. So mm -hmm. was that a factor? He took off to maybe take care of you? Or was he hurt? I, I don't wonder. think it wasn't, it wasn't on purpose. No, um, there was it, just no fights. It yeah, was. I think it was one of those times, like, for whatever reason, like, we just – we couldn't get any fights booked or maybe that's probably when some stuff fell through or whatever. A couple, um, a couple of fights fell. I remember, I don't remember who it was, but a couple of fights fell through and then I had to go back home to Louisiana, take care of some family shit. So there was probably a three or four month period where I was still, I was piecing together training, but back then there was nobody doing jujitsu in Louisiana at the time or that I could find. And I wound up like, I was, boxing boxing, I was training at a boxing gym and like, a couple guys at a college or wrestling room were training with me. It was just like real piecemeal shit together. So I wasn't looking for a fight at that point, just because I didn't have the ability to put in a good camp. Um, so probably between fights falling through and that family bullshit, it was just like not working out. Yeah. Okay. And in 2003, it, we, we pick up where like now both of you are active and Amanda uh, takes a trip to Utah and uh, Monty Cox is a promoter. And okay. this time you you get Jennifer Howe, who's probably oh, yeah. that was that was that's another crazy thing. Like I I don't regret it at all because I I maintained this mindset all through fighting that I just would I would I would step to whoever wanted to fight. You know, like I I had no I just didn't have that thing where I was trying to like build myself up and build my record and whatever because that that was only my third fight. And I literally think I had three minutes of ring time. Like my first fight lasted about a minute. My fight with uh, Chris Van Fleet, I think lasted about two minutes. And that's what I was going into that fight with, with Jen Howe, which was just so, insane because at the time I think she was like number one or something like that. Yeah. It's, it was, it's, it's I'm, too I'm, hard. It's too hard. It, people are always impressed is the wrong word. That sounds arrogant. People are always, you know, like, uh, People are always impressed with the fact that we have always said yes to every fight. Like we're about fighting, not about padding records and not about building a social media following and not about trying to look cool or whatever. We've always been about the challenge and not about trying to, uh, to get something out of it. We want, what we wanted to get out of it was development for ourselves and accomplishment for ourselves, Right. And we've carried that onto our students. And like, I had that attitude. I didn't pick fights. I just took whatever was there. Mandy took whatever was there. We started doing that with a lot of our early fighters through our gym. And we're now probably in the last 10 years having to learn how to look at it differently because it is now kind of to the detriment. You can't go in with that attitude anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just can't. Those days are gone. And it's 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 been a hard thing for us to try to... I mean, because we, we're not looking for tomato cans. We're not, you know what I mean? We're just never going to be those fucking people. I want my, I want our people to be challenged and still accomplish things, but it's been a really hard mindset to shift from like any fucking person that stands in front of us. We fight no matter what to like, is this the appropriate fight? Is this a good fight? Is this time? a good matchup? Is like, it, you know whatever. what I mean? Like Godzilla for a dollar? Fuck yeah, let's go. I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it's. Yeah, but that, that fight, that, that Jen Hell fight was so miserable. It was, 
it was a great fight. I mean, it was it was short and it was a great fight to watch. Um, yeah. it was not so great of a fight for me to be in <laughs> because cut, I mean, cut for both thing, of your corneas. Yeah, like and it was crazy because I didn't even feel it during the fight. Um, obviously, like I got knocked out, like not unconscious, unconscious, but um TKO or whatever. And so in my face was all fucked up. And uh, I got backstage and all of a sudden I started to have such insane pain. I felt like there was glass in my eyes and it was because I had a, a stuff had been done to my corneas and I literally, I could not open my eyes. Jay had to hold on to me in the airport because between the bruising and the cornea, I literally couldn't open my eyes and people were watching us walk through the airport and looking at him. Like I was like a, uh, abused. <laughs> abused yeah, cause I look like I look and she's all fucked up and she's walking two feet behind me, holding my arm. And I'm like, holding, like she yeah. can't see, this is not where I make her walk. She can't fucking see. dude. <laughs> it was awful. I, Oh my God. That was, my face was in so much pain after that fight. We actually were, because we Jen were, and I, Jen and I became friends at that point. Um, and I think we both just felt like that was such a great fight as far as, you know, we both just gave it our all and it was such a great fight for people to watch. And, um, we became friends after that and friends with Jeremy, who I just love Jeremy. He's awesome. Um, so that, He's that was really great. Chain a bunch, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's interesting. Cause obviously, you know, on the women's side, you don't have as much lore or stories, but you know, that, that respect you, you earn with like your opponent that, that you know you found out with Jennifer that that kind of transcends another one of those things that transcends right so yep. I think it's pretty cool yeah. because Jen spoke really respect I, I I got to interview her and she was really respectful of of, of all the ladies as well so yeah you yeah. actually and end up cornering like that. didn't you go help her with a fight didn't you corner her against yeah I saw I was, she was going to end up fighting I think she was having a, a I think it was a rematch with Roxanne um, Modafari. And uh, she actually asked me to come out and help during that camp. Um, yeah. So I flew out to Utah and uh, we trained a bunch and it was leading up to that fight. And then I was in her corner with Jeremy um, when she did that fight. So that was that was cool to be able to go out there and do that. Didn't go her way. That, what, well, what was that experience? Like wrist lock, wasn't it? It was so, it was so, uh, that's always the hardest thing for me. Like I would rather be the one in there fighting it's so hard for me when like people I care about fight, like I get so stressed out <laughs> and, and I just, I wanted her to win so bad, you know? And it was, it was just such a bummer because I, like, I didn't want her to be bummed out about it. You know what I mean? I didn't want her to be really upset about it. And she fought really hard and she fought really well. And, you know, Roxanne just caught her in, I think, I think she ended oh, you up. said it was a normal the, plotter with a wrist lock. It, and that was, and Jen was just so mentally tough. It's like watching that was painful for me because she let it go so far. She just was like, I'm, no, I'm not going to tap. And it was just watching it was painful. It was, it was bad. Yeah. I can oh. do terrible shit to people, but I can't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've broken a lot of shit on people. Like I've done a lot of bad, terrible, I've beaten the fuck out of people. I've done a lot of bad stuff and I can do it and be totally fine doing it and in the gym if something goes wrong like people dislocate something i can replace things like all day like i can i'm i'm, I'm good with emergencies like in an emergency i can handle whatever i'm very good in emergencies but if it's not just watching it on tv You're squeamish that shit comes up on my facebook feed and i'm like eh, I scroll as fast like as when can. somebody throws a kick and then they it gets checked and their nope. chin breaks or something he can't watch any of that <laughs> if it was in my gym i could reset the bone and be fine and if yeah. it was in a fight and i did it i'd be fine or if they did it i'd be fine but just watching it cold on tv no mm. man i want to puke i can't do that shit <laughs> yeah that chris weedman injuries I, that was tough to watch yeah. <laughs> i know what you mean. uh jay on your end 2003 you kind of picked up where you left off started winning you got you yeah and into 2004 you had a couple wins uh isaiah martinez mm -hmm. donnie reigns john cronk what do you remember about that little one this is ring of fire this is sven yeah. being talk about how the his promotion came up i'll tell you a funny story i, I ran into him I was already hook and shoot, kind of known for being with hook and shoot. 
Yeah. I ran into him at an airport coming home from a UFC, and okay. Sven knew who I was. He sat me down and he gave me a little binder with was was his Ring of Fire business plan. Nice. And I I didn't give him any advice. You know, I was probably drunk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the airport. <laughs> I didn't give him any advice or anything. He did everything on his own. I'm not taking any credit for what he did, but he was uh, hustling back then even. So uh, so yeah. how did you guys meet him? How did that work out for you guys? You guys were stars with him. Yeah, yeah we were. We were pretty, he was, he was, uh, we were pretty involved with him, you know, when we were still living in Colorado. He yeah. was, I think he was actually, wasn't he managing us for a little while before mm-hmm. we left? And he, wasn't he like booking some fights? I don't know that he was an official manager, but I remember he was very helpful. He would call us. Yeah, he would help us find like matchups and get us on the ring of fire. Like that was one of the shows that we fought on a lot. Which, yeah. I mean, he was, he was a local guy. Like we were fighting in Colorado at the time and he was local. Um, In 2003, we had moved uh, back to Maine or to Maine, but he was still very involved with us. Like we, so he would put us on the card still. We'd still sell tickets back there, you know? So he was still booking us. um, And that was cool. But uh, yeah, he was a, he was one of my favorite promoters. He was really, really good to the fighters. He was really honest. Like he wasn't shysty at all. Always did what he said. You know what I mean? Page what he said he was going to pay you. He didn't yeah. like, didn't do anything shady or anything like that. Like he was always a really, really good promoter and it was cool. Um, and, and there's so few of those, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that was always really stressful. It's like um, there were so many promoters and it was it was hard to find the ones that you felt like you could trust. And once you found them, it's like, you know, you tried to stick with those people oh. and tried to keep fighting for them because otherwise it's like, you don't know, you know, if you're going to get paid, like, you don't, <laughs> it was just so sketchy, you know, well, that's why you'll see, like, people. you'll see somebody fight for the same show a bunch. It's part of it is because they find somebody that you want to work with. You're like, this guy's cool. That guy, that guy's legit. Yep. He's not yeah. an asshole. I'm comfortable with him. I'm sticking. You know what I mean? Instead of just trying to market yourself around and look for other stuff because you never know who you're going to get, you know? Yeah. Now, I don't know. It may be a little bit different now, but I'm not sure, you know? Um, yeah, yeah but... no, I think, I think it's progressed now with lawyers and managers and management. Yeah. And you yeah. rarely get, uh, you know, that individual touch of where you know a person or you know the promoter or anything like that. Um Somewhere in there, you guys mentioned a show at the Pepsi Center, and that it happens to be uh, uh, you fought Janelle Marquez, Amanda, but yeah. that happens to be the IFC Global Domination, which is a legendary show in September 2003. Uh, that's that eight man tournament that Babalu yeah. beat Jeremy Horn in the finals and stuff. What was your take? What's your take on that show? Obviously, kind of your hometown. They probably had you on the undercard. How was that? That was a little. Um... I mean, it was, it was great because I, you know, I always was just in that mentality of focusing on the fight, but it was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit overwhelming because it was a very huge show. Like it was, yeah, Yeah. it was like at the Pepsi center. It was, there was so many good people in it. Um, there was just like the stands were so huge, you know, there was so many people there. It, It was definitely a huge step up from what I had experienced before that. So it was just, there was that part that was just a little bit like, holy shit, this is, this is a huge show. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you come out, it was the first time, like when you come out, there's anything like your name going around yeah. on the arena. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I was like, holy shit. You came from fucking fighting. I, I mean, I, was, I came from you know, warming yeah. up in cow shit, you know, or like, <laughs> Yeah. 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 yeah, no, we, uh, definitely. We in, in hook and shoot at some point. We had this little uh, piece of paper that was colored like a. Uh, it wasn't even paper. It was like a cellophane that was colored like flames, and it, it had a fan behind it that would make it move. So it looked like, but there was no flames there at all. You know. Yeah. So awesome. I, I know what you're talking about. That, that that did you have any problems at that show getting paid on the men's side? This is interesting. The contract was an eight man tournament. So the guys knew what they were going to get to show for the first fight, and they knew they'd get fifty grand if they won the whole thing. But the you know, what if I go two and one? What if I go one and two? You know, what if I you know or you know, none of those in between numbers were figured out. They had to figure that out at the show. Did any that makes me nervous. That would make me nervous. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe because I I think that that it was fine for me if I 
I don't remember any problem with that, but I think it was probably because like I wasn't part of the tur- tournament. You yeah. know, so I wasn't part of the thing where there was a huge uh purse that you could win. You don't know? you so, remember don't you remember though? Like we we <laughs> there was I'm not even gonna say who we had some Brazilian guys there that knew us through a mall and uh they didn't want to fill out the W2s because they were like, you know, I don't know what their status was or whatever. They were all tripped out about the fact that they wanted people to sign things. They were like, whoa, 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 give me cash, give me cash, right? Yeah. And so they were freaking out about it. And so we said that we were their manager. I said, uh, maybe, maybe it was just me. I said that I was their manager and they paid me and then we paid them. And at the time I was just like, yeah, whatever, dude, we're just shuffling papers around. Who gives a shit? It wasn't until like later that year that I realized I'm paying 15% on that or like, whatever, like I lost, cause I took it in as income and then gave them cash and wasn't thinking about it and was just like, oh. I fucked up. Like I just lost some. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like a year later that I figured it out because I didn't know anything about fucking taxes. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't thinking about it. No, no, no. It's definitely, definitely the wall was. Amanda, do you remember your payday for that? You, you got, you got a nice win. I have no idea what I. I think it was, um, you know, especially for back then. I think it was a good purse. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was definitely a a big step up from you know what I had uh, experienced previous to that. And you to be put a figure two thousand bucks. I I feel like maybe it was something. I think it was more than that. I don't want to say. I thought like, I had three I for some reason sticks in my head. Okay. Three thousand. Um, I don't know if that's right, but it 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 seems like it was in that range somewhere, you know. And and before that, it, it was way less than that. Yeah, yeah you're right. And you're right. From three thousand would have been is a good payday, you know, yeah. back then for men yeah. or women. So for sure, because that's good, good on the IFC for that one. And that, you know, definitely qualifies as a, as a, a, a legendary show. Amanda said it was eye opening. Jay, was it eye opening for you too? Because obviously, you know, from Wyoming and from this background, now this, you know, part of what is a, you know, turns this into a sport is the crowds and the show and stuff like that. How'd you yeah, hated that that's, part. The hardest, that's the hardest yeah. part, man. Like I would have done everybody, everybody that knows me well has always said this. They're like, if you took that guy out in a parking lot and pulled a knife on him, he would do so much better than if you yeah. you're just you're it. better at yeah. real world stuff and yeah. worse Dude, the at the closer, the closer yeah. it is. Like, so for example, it's ridiculous. But if you book me like a straight, no rules, Valley Tudo fight, like no rules whatever no problem i'll perform i might not win necessarily but i a hundred percent of me will show up right you'll perform if, at your the level at my potential i at. will be at my potential if, if you make it sport mma it's like 85 percent of me shows up like i i have to struggle to find the right mindset it's like an 85 percent chance that i am in the right headspace maybe sometimes i'm not and i have to struggle to get there sport jujitsu it's the worst Sport oh, yeah. jiu-jitsu. I'm like, the further you get away from dying, the more I'm like, oh, I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> it's the worst. You, you know, and and uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for you, Jay, and everything. You take even your, you, you know, you're a great competitor. So don't sure. sell yourself so short. But are you um, are you a little bit like split personality because it's like the, that competition thing? But then you're such a good coach too. Like like you worry about your coaching stuff. It's like. How come you can't coach yourself? Like, you know, I, 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 and I don't mean that. I just mean that like to help, I don't, you know? No, no, no. So I, I, thank you. I, I, I take teaching and coaching, I think is kind of my gift, right? Like uh, fighting, fighting my, like actual interpersonal for meaning and for value, like to protect my family or something like real honest to God fighting is, is one of my, I'm good at it. It's my gift, right? handling an emergency. I'm a, I'm a wonderful emergency person, but in reality, like fighting and athletics and being a competitor is not my strength. It's something I strove to be good at, but I'm not natural at it. It wasn't, it wasn't your natural gift. Like you're, you have a crazy, insane, natural gift for teaching and coaching. Like those um, are interchangeable for me. Yeah, like yeah. your ability in that arena is like, I, people, it's hard to even explain because people don't understand it until they experience it. You know, either you work with them or whatever it's, you're just very unique in that way. And most people 
aren't that good at it, sure. you know? That's my gift for sure. Like I'm, uh, I'm lucky. Like I do spend a lot of effort on it. I do spend a lot of, I have put a lot of effort into being good at it also, but I can't, uh, I can't even pretend that it's all hard work. Like it's a gift for some reason. Right. I was just yeah. happy to have it. Right. Um, but I don't think like the world's best psychologist has a therapist. And you'd be like, well, that makes no sense because you know how why to do you just <laughs> why don't you just do that shit to yourself? Yeah. But it's like you can I can it, it, it's it's almost like a an offshoot of the emergency thing. I think when there's a when there's an outside of me important this matters moment, I lose myself in it. But when it is not about someone else and it's not for some real like this is to live this is to make a point this is to teach a lesson this is to defend a family this is to help you with your goal if it's just me and there's no real purpose of it i get kind of stuck in myself it's hard for me to lose myself i have to spend a lot of effort being in that moment and being present but anytime it's about an outside thing either an outside goal or an outside person then i can just be there and i don't have those issues you know so I think I look at it like a, I'm a good psychiatrist, like I'm a good therapist, but I still need my own therapist. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That makes that makes good sense. And and uh so now Amanda, let's let's pick up where, where we left off with you here. So at some point, Jacqueline Andrade, uh, then Janelle Marquez, oh. and then you run into Laura Diog. Unless there's, if you want remember anything from those two fights, but I wanted to talk about the Diogas because you fought her twice and and yep. What went on there? Usually there'll be a story there. So take us through that. Janelle Marquez, Jacqueline Andrade, and Laura Diogas. Yeah, so Janelle Marquez was a good fight. Um, uh, it was fairly sh- – I don't think it went out of the first round. Um, right. So I, I felt pretty good about that one. You know, that was okay. <laughs> um, and then the fight after that, uh, was that uh, – what was her name? Was that the – Laura Diogas? Oh, yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, for me, there was a very big uh, uh, transformation that happened. I got really into uh, the sports psychology aspect of things because up until I fought um, up until I fought Shayna the first time, all of my losses before that were I, I kind of lost the fight myself. Um, I just, I had a real, um, I kind of, it was like imposter syndrome a little bit. So Mm -hmm. I would go into every fight kind of with this fear of like, oh, you know, this is where I'm going to be shown that I, you know, this person's going to be so much better than me that it's, I'm going to look like, I don't even know what I'm doing, you know, or I had, I had that problem. And every time I would get in a fight, because that was in the back of my head, it was almost like, something would happen someone would get close to a finish like in that first I think it was the first fight with Laura August you know the fight was good and I was doing well um and it it was going back and forth and it was a good fight and then we got went to the ground I think she got close to some finish but I still remember it's almost like she started to try the finish and I didn't even really defend it because what was happening in my mind is I would kind of feel like see that you know I knew that was going to happen so right. it's like the second day, it's like, I I kind of almost let it happen when somebody would get to a place where they were close to being able to finish me or something. Um, and it was all mental. It was, and I knew that, like, it was all just a mental thing. Like I, I couldn't get my brain in the right place. And then I started doing all this work on sports psychology and applying it to every day when I was training, most of what I was doing was working with my mind. And I... That's the thing I think I made the biggest strides in. And I still remember it was that first fight with Shayna where everything changed for me. And I started to be able to actually apply all that stuff I had been working on um, with my mentality. That's when it switched. And after that, every fight that I lost, I, I didn't lose another fight that was because of my mind. I lost fights because, you know, I made a mistake or whatever. But I just, I was a totally different fighter 
um, between like before the fight with Shayna and after. So to me, it's almost like it feels like a before and after, you know, because it was so it felt so different for me. So yeah. like that, you know, that what was that girl's name? Jacqueline Andrade. Andrade. Yeah. So that fight was miserable. She was also very big. Um, she was how can really, I remember your fights, but not mine? I don't know. I I remember her being really big, and I remember I just went out uh and I just went as hard as I possibly could. And of course, then it's like I was just exhausted. And um she jumped on something and it was that same thing where I was like, Oh, I, I knew that was gonna happen. I think she got like an arm, yeah, she like popped my arm or something like that. Um, and then yeah, I think maybe it was Laura Doggis after that. And it wasn't until I hit that first fight with Shayna, that's when everything started to to change for me. Yeah, Jack Jack Dempsey, the legendary boxing champion, said, you know, while you're thinking, I'm punching you in the face. You know, yeah. they, it's like you can't, it, you got to be a cerebral fighter. You got to learn technique. You need a brain, you know, but yep. you can't carry that into the fight, it seems. Yep. And I, and I took that stuff. It it made such a difference um, in my fighting, but I also felt like it was just, it made a difference as far as who I was as a person, because all the, you know, all the stuff that I was learning with the psychology stuff applied across the board. And I also really started to have, because we had a bunch of people fighting at that point, And I started to work that same stuff that I had been working on. I started to make them work that in too. Um, so everybody, like our, our main people that were fighting back then, they also were uh, really into the psychology part of it, just because I I kind of made them be that way. One of the only so, coaches in the country that when you go, I want to fight, she's like, here's your reading list. Yeah, yeah. like I would, I would make them <laughs> read these books. And then yeah. like when we were training, like, you know, it was just such a, it was such a huge focus um, for me anyway, and it made a huge difference. Uh, awesome now so you you mentioned the Shayna fight as, as as the watershed fight but you actually headed into that fight kind of riding the ship you got uh, a a winning streak going and you got that winning streak started at smack girl which is a trip you oh. the retirement fight for yuki kondo and a trip to japan oh. which a lot of the men don't get to do so this this had to be low pay but special what do you, what, well, what do you yeah it was um and it was crazy because it was very clear that uh, this was she was really good you know at the time like she was considered uh very high up um and it was very obvious to us when we got there that i was basically being brought in as her it was going to be her big retirement fight and her big win you know what i mean and it was just really clear that i was being brought in as a person for her to beat um and then it obviously went completely the other way and i i think i finished her with a with a knee bar and it was just everyone was kind of in shock like remember they like all the people nobody really even knew no, everybody was really quiet even yeah. to the point where like they had like they had like the ceremony you know, so the, the plan was mandy would lose they would she would exit the ring and then after she the big... in the ring they would have the big retirement thing right and that was the plan and so they have this choreography set right and so mandy beats her everybody's like nobody everybody's like oh She's shit silent. Like, people are like uh we're supposed <laughs> to clap but it was like well, i mean she got awful. she literally got carried off remember so they yeah was well, they they didn't take her out of the ring you remember they put her in a seat and were giving her attention they had ice on her leg and she was in a seat and we were like why aren't they taking her out of the ring like they should be taking her out of the ring she's hurt yeah. and they talked to you and we were like okay but then they didn't let us leave and then they talked to her and she's like, I don't know what the fuck she's saying. Cause it's Japanese, yeah, it's, it's Japanese. and she's talking and it's very solemn. And it's obviously like, I wanted to win or whatever. And then she announced her retirement and they went, they had like the confetti. Can oh no. It's like she retired. <laughs> and the thing goes, and everybody kind of like, uh, super awkward. And then they yeah, carry us to the ring. And then we but it was, in. it was an amazing experience because like the fact that I got those opportunities to fight in those overseas uh, fights, that was an amazing time for us. And we really, we knew it at the time. So every time we were able to do that, we, I really tried to take advantage of the fact that we were in these other countries. So we wouldn't, I wouldn't just focus on the fight. Like we, 
uh, when we got to Japan, I remember the day of the fight, like we, I, we must've walked like six miles because we so were just, funny. we were going everywhere and trying to take it all in and trying to get the most out of every single trip that we went on. Who knows uh, when we're coming back ever. Yeah. Cause every time I was like, I probably will never be back here. So we really tried to, uh, just get everything out of those trips that we could every time we traveled to these other countries. And I felt very lucky to get opportunities to, to do that and go so many places. Did, did you ever feel like since it was her retirement fight now they, they actually bought her back one more time put her in against Merlo's Conan and the oh. exact same thing happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah the poor girl she just like wanted to have a good final retirement fight and just <laughs> just she picked, she picked it off I can't you can't blame her she picked solid opponents that's for sure yes. but uh, uh, so, but uh, did anybody approach you? Was there anything weird beforehand where they were like trying to hint at, you know, take it easy, give it up or, you know, do the right thing? No, I think they just didn't think I was very good. Um, yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like I, cause I had some losses up to that point. Um, yeah. You know, I think, I don't even know what my record was at that point, but I think it wasn't that great. And I, I think they, yeah, I just think they didn't think my skill level was very high. Um, and so that's what they were expecting. So nobody really said anything. I think they just thought I was going to come in and be worse than I was. <laughs> she was coming out of she was coming out of Egan in a ways camp, and I, he doesn't strike me as the dude that works fights. You know what I mean? Like he seems yeah. like a guy that wants to actually get it done. Well, and, and also, he, why I think he picked you and fucking Conan as opponents. Like he what he didn't even look after the thing with you. He wasn't like let's get a tomato can he's still i think he was looking for a real smash the fucking monster and have that be your retirement it just didn't yeah. work out yeah so well, no, cool. nobody, ever, nobody ever said that and i mean neither one of us would ever fucking can. i think both of oh, us would yeah be. that would have been crazy <laughs> yeah you know and i think that to a certain extent you know they may have picked up on that. You know, that's why the offer never came or, you know, maybe I've been just in fantasy land, like a con conspiracy theorist, but, but, uh, you know, uh, more power to you for, for conducting yourselves uh, on the up and up like that and enjoying Japan, because I always get a little sad when I hear it, it's like, Oh, I hated it. You know, the food and, and you could see it go wrong for people psychologically. And at least you made yeah. the most. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was challenging. Like I can understand how, uh, especially back then people had a hard time with it because, you know, back then it's not like you flew in a, a week ahead of time, you yeah. know, and then had all this time to acclimate and train and whatever, like they literally flew us in. And I think there was, we flew in day. Friday morning, like we, we flew, flew in Friday morning, Friday yeah. night was way in Saturday was the flight. We left. Yeah. Sunday. So it was just, um, in that, in that respect, like it was challenging because that, I mean, that's a crazy long flight. Um, it just, everything is, is thrown off. Um, and the time frames are just so, were so short. Um, so you really, like, I kind of went in, like you were still jet lagged. You were, you know, the time was all messed up. Um, so it was challenging in that way, just because you, you didn't get there early enough to acclimate it all, you know? I'll, I'll tell you a fast story Jason Delucia told me. Obviously, UFC one veteran. He fought in Japan and Pancrase over 50 times. And he said the time he got knocked out, a guy came up to him right as he's about to do his ring entrance with an old-time 50s camera and asked him, picture please? And boom, the flash blinded him, and he walked in, got knocked out in a minute. Oh my God. <laughs> he, he, told, he told the student, the story at some point and then years later was cornering the guy and he swears to God it was actually even the same photographer that said picture please and he sent this guy out without taking the picture. Yeah, yeah he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> they can make it difficult for you if they want, but uh, I'm glad you had a good experience there and, and, and that's Smack Girl, which you got to give them credit as a historic show for on the women's side, you know? Yeah, and it was it was it was really great because it was one of the first shows that, um, you know, was a women's show. Yeah. It was, a, it was a little weird just because they had really strange rules. Um, but I trained for them, you know, like one of the things that was so Jay is really, really great at, um, game plans 
And he's really great at looking at the specific opponent and making the training camp uh, really based around uh, the rule set or whatever and the opponent that I was fighting. So even though it was strange, like I felt prepared when I went in, um, it was just a little weird to have that thing where there's like, where there's no striking on the ground. It was, <laughs> the rules were, were strange. Okay. 30 second time limit on the ground. No strike. Yeah, no strike. Yeah. It was in the gloves were like really, really poofy. It was, yeah, it was, it was a little bit weird, but it was great. I, I enjoyed both times that we were there. Now, Jay, as you're going, we're going to go back here to you. You, you've got a little bit of a grind coming up where, uh, you know, the level of opponent all jumps up here to guys that, that are known quantities. Brendan Seguin, yep. Brad Blackburn, Josh Neer, and then we'll get into Euphoria. But uh, how did that feel? Extreme Challenge, Josh Neer, you're kind of going into the lion's yeah. den. Neer's a Man, tough guy. You were like throwing beer on us when we were walking into the ring, dude. They were mad. It was like. Monty Cox set that show up. The name of the show, like the thing on the on the flyers, was like Iowa versus the world. <laughs> it, was yeah, just, it was it was just everybody was like, like the second you walked out. Yeah. I mean that was a good fight, man. Like the Seguin fight, the Seguin fight. That was a was horrible like, fight. Yeah, it went. It was. It yeah. was. It was. But I also um, feel like I think that was not at the right weight class. Like he was no, way it was, bigger. It was. Than it was up a weight. I was bouncing back and forth between eighty-five and seventy. You were way too small for eighty. I was way too small for eighty-five, yeah. but but I was taking <laughs> fights because, like I said, we just took fights, right? Yeah. Um, and that was a weird one. Not making excuses, like uh, in you any way. Per- he it. performed really shitty in that fight. Well, not not taking anything away from the guy at all, like because no, he, he, he he whooped my ass and he's very tough. And like on my best day in the best set of circumstances, I could still lose a fight to the guy, right? So I'm not talking shit. But like I remember there being a really, it was a it was in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and they had the strangest thing that we found out about at the fight, like going over the rules meeting before the fight. And they were like, no kicking from guard. You cannot kick up at all. Not to the knees, not to the body, not to the head. And okay. I was uh, uh, tactically unprepared for that. Because at some point, I ended up in my guard, on my back, open guard. And I felt like at the time, either one of the circ- if he were to withdraw and let me up, I felt pretty confident that I would take him down. And if he dove into my guard, I felt very confident that I could handle, I felt confident my ability to handle the grappling exchange, right? But he didn't. He just sat with my feet right about two inches from his face, (laughs) hitting me with the hardest fucking shots. And every time I would post on his hips to push him away, the ref was like, no kicking. And I'd pull my knees back. Just, I was like, dude, I just got fucking obliterated. I was bleeding out of my ears and shit. Like I got obliterated. I was unable to solve the the strategic puzzle of what if, you know what I mean? Like I just never had been presented with that. What if, what if they don't withdraw, they don't go in and you're not allowed to kick from open guard. I, well, just I mean, and the entire, that. like one of the very core things of our, you know, entire training and our entire gym is too far, too close. Yeah, yeah, of course. You say that all the time. Kick, like, you, you you've got to be too far, too, far. too close. But yes. they took away, you had no ability. But again, like, I'm not making them. excuses. <laughs> like, even on my best day with the rules to my favor, he probably, he could have whooped my ass anyway. Cause, like, it's, he was a tough dude, right? I'm not talking shit. But I was on, that was one of the things that puts me in the zone of like wanting to really get strategy prepared. Because when you find yourself in strategic conundrums like that, where you don't have an answer, it's super frustrating. And I just couldn't pull it off on the fly to come up with anything. Um, and then the near fight was, was a great fight. Great fight. I mean, I w- I'm super proud of that fight. Yeah, that was a terrific fight. Like some even of the fights I've lost, lost. It, it was like, it was really good. Like you, you did really well in that fight. Some of the fights I've lost. I'm, I'm more, I'm I, some of my proudest fights I have lost and some of the fights I'm the most ashamed of I've won. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, it's weird like that. It's and not I think, win or loss. It's how you perform inside. And I think in the near fight, I did really well. I just didn't pull it off. I lost I, and I think if I remember correctly, I think at one point you even dropped him. And I think up until that point, I don't think oh, that- nobody had ever dropped him before that. Like I dropped him and like knocked his mouthpiece out. I don't know, like 12 fucking times. Like at some point, at some point I knocked his mouthpiece out and just backed up and pointed at it. And he picked it up. We shook hands and kept going because it yeah. was just getting absurd like it yeah, came up that was so, a terrific right. fight that you just happened to lose so that yeah. was a bummer. 
Yeah, I like, I like Josh. I figured that that might be a fight with two guys kind of cut from the same cloth, at least, you know, no Yeah, quit. he was really tough and just like... He was super know. nice to me afterwards. He was like, it was maybe his birthday or something. He was like, that's the best that's the way to have a fight. Yeah, he, he was so yeah. pumped, man. Yeah, I, I like him. All. One of the reasons I like him, he's funny, too. We called him up to do the interview when I was doing it with a group of people. And if we didn't have a fighter with us, he wasn't he wasn't even gonna do the interview. He's like, nah, I'm not talking to reporters. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I understand. That's okay. Um yeah. let's go uh, to Ring of Fire 20. You guys fought together. This may be one of those situations where and this is the first Shayna fight, so we'll get to focus on that a little bit, Amanda. But I was looking at it and if I'm not mistaken, you guys got like co-feature did it suck to like come out right away, Jay, like after cornering her? How did all that work out? Because, um, you know, she had a great fight and you, uh, you know, you took a loss here. Wait, with Who Blackburn? Who that one against? Uh, let me just double check. I beat, I beat Blackburn. This I is Thomas Schulte. This is Thomas Schulte. Schulte, I got Schulte. I lost. Yeah, Schulte, I lost. Yeah. No, man. It was, uh, dude. It's it a, wasn't. A, it wasn't a great setup for us to do. Like we hadn't done it up until that point, and it wasn't the best. It I wasn't actually, the best thing. I like for it us better. To do. I like it better because you it did, yeah, but you didn't perform. On. You didn't perform well. I didn't. But that night wasn't one of my head trip nights. That that night wasn't that bad. Like that was literally a. Like if you go back, I mean, it's a very quick fight, but I remember like. I threw a leg kick. He caught the kick. I went down. Uh, he stood up in my guard. I tried to do that fucking, remember that little back roll sweep that I was obsessed with for a while. I tried to do it and I got stuck on his leg and he grabbed my neck and I stood up and was going to do like a big fucking fireman's or something. And that prick just had the craziest grip on my neck and it put me right in the back and I just got choked. I mean, that one was a, I felt like I went out and fought. I didn't hesitate. Like I felt like I went out and fought. I just blew it. Like it was a tactical, I made a tactical air. I don't feel like that when I laid down on, I just made a tactical air, yeah. but I prefer cornering you before my fights because it gives me it something, gives you something to think gives about. Me something to think about, man. I loved it. Like we've had a bunch of fights where either all me, you and one of our fighters would fight on the same card mm -hmm. or me and one of my one of the other fighters not necessarily you but like i like it when i have other people on the card i like it much better it feels like all of us are going into battle it gives me something to think about before you know it you don't have six hours of just twiddling your goddamn thumbs yeah. like before you know it it's your turn to fight you know i like okay. it much i like it much better so amanda at this point you get Shane. At, at this point you have a little bit of an uh experience advantage over she's kind of more of an up-and-comer at this do you feel like and you said it came together for you, um, you know, mentally and stuff like that. Do you feel like this was a, a, a statement win? And then how do you feel about seeing Shayna's success nowadays? Uh, well, I, I really like Shayna. Um, you know, she, uh, she, I mean, we're not friends in the sense that we talk all the time, um, but we've connected a couple times over the years over, you know, various things. And she was always super nice, you know, so I, I really enjoyed fighting her. Um, she didn't have like, you know, a shitty attitude or anything like that, but she was very good. You know, even that first time I fought her, like she was very well-rounded. Um, and she was really, I feel like we were pretty similar in skill level at that point. Um, and the, and that was, a that was the point where kind of all that work I had been putting in finally, uh, did something and i remember the exact moment actually like we were i don't even remember what happened but we were going back and forth um it was a pretty good fight it was a pretty even fight and i tried to do something um and somehow she ended up on my back like fully on my back and i think i was kind of like on my knees and then trying to figure out where to go to best get her off but in that moment that is a moment where i would have previous to that when she got on the back, I would have been like, that's it. You know, I knew that was going to happen. Like she's on my back. She's going to choke me. And that probably would have been the end of the fight. And it was the first time, like all the ways that I had been training that kicked in finally. And I was able to get past that sticking point of feeling like voice and not listen. 
Yeah. I just like, I finally just kept going forward and I just kept, I was like thinking about the next thing. And all I was thinking about was how can I get to a point where I can do damage and that instead of thinking about, Oh, I'm going to get finished or, you know, worrying about something happening to me or worrying about losing all I, all I focused on from then on and all my fights is just moving forward, not thinking about anything other than what was happening in that moment. And I was constantly thinking about how can I get to the place where I can do damage to this person, whether it was, you know, a grappling situation or stand up or whatever was happening. That's all I would let myself think about. And it, and it just radically changed. And I, I escaped that position. I don't even remember exactly how, um, and then ended up finishing her with an arm bar. And from then on, like it, it just totally changed everything. Now, since the the August uh, loss, you're now four and zero, including a win over Shayna, the win over Yuki Kondo in Japan at Smack Girl, and you get another call from Smack Girl, and this is to fight Megumi Abushida, a judo yeah. legend. Yeah. How, how did this? Uh, how did this feel? Because I, I know Yabushita pretty well. She's uh, an amazing competitor, also. Uh, how how was the feel about this one? Did she treat you good, or was she giving you the pro wrestling cold shoulder? No, I think she was she was pretty nice, wasn't she? She was nice. Yeah, I think she was Everybody pretty nice. Was that was a really hard. That was a really irritating fight to train for, actually, um, because she had a couple things that were very specific that she re really used to catch people with. Um, one of them was that weird. It, that weird thing she did Her where she wrist lock. yeah she'd do like a wrist lock but then she'd like spin under and she like caught a ton of people with that and yeah. it was such a uh it was such a move that wasn't done so i had never experienced it, it. So she so, caught a lot of people with that she caught her. a lot of people with that so between that and the judo the training was so frustrating because you know all through the training i would just get finished as all my training partners would mimic what she was going to be doing um, but then it then it worked out because by the time I got to the actual fight, I was capable of answering everything that she threw at me and didn't get caught in any of those things. And then what did I? Oh, I think I uh, guillotined her. Yeah. 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 Those, those camps are always the most frustrating when somebody has a really particular game plan. Yeah. Those are the most frustrating because for the first half of camp. You're just getting finished not and finding the answers and because like... their game works because it's novel and it's difficult to deal with. And then as you're learning the responses, you're not good at them yet. And it's like, it's really frustrating. But then after a while you start to get good at the responses. And by the time you fight, you're like, nothing is surprising, but that's, yeah, yeah those camps are incredibly frustrating in the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to, you really have to be in a good mental place because you are just getting beat so much. You know, like I was just getting finished so much and I was getting thrown so much because everyone was trying to do like the judo throws. And so I was just getting constantly tossed and finished. And, mm -hmm. you know, until I was like three quarters of the way through the camp and it started to finally click. So I, I still remember that camp. It was so irritating. <laughs> that camp. And who was the other girl you fought? The other uh, that was in Russia. Uh, Akana. Yeah, yeah let's, she was like let's, crazy judo. She was let like, let me get there. Let me get there yeah. because yeah, we're about to, those are the shows I match made for you. So we'll, yep. we'll round out around there. the The first interaction we had, I believe, I booked uh, Jay in Atlantic City to fight Steve Bruno. Yep. And uh, Jay, what do you remember about that? Because we 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 did uh, Atlantic City where you went one on one with Bruno, an American Top Team guy. And then you, you made the best of your return in Atlantic City uh, against Chris Liguori, a local uh, ticket seller who you beat. So I forgot about I forgot about the Chris Liguori fight, honestly, yeah. until Keith Mills was writing a book and wrote me about something. And he was like, Liguori. And I was like, I don't remember that. Yeah, <laughs> How would I do? He goes, you won. I was like, oh, yeah. sweet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the Bruno fight was a, was a tough one because it was like uh, – that was the one where that was the one where I was sick, wasn't it? And I wasn't in your corner. So that and was the, that was, like... that's the, actually the only time I fought after my beginning where she wasn't in the corner. And it really, it kind of, it was, it was hard for me because you just uh, were mentally like not there. I was not present. I should have, I, sh I, what I should have done is gone. You're sick. I'm taking you home. 
and like pulled it. And as bad as that would have pissed everybody off, like if I was trying to take care of my career, that's, that would have been the right move. But for me, it's hard for me to not fight. It's hard for me to say no to anything fight related. Like I, I, one, it's hard for me to say no to fights too. I have this, like, I made a commitment. I got to stick yeah, to it. Yeah, we said we would do it. We I'm know. that guy. Like, I'm that. It's, yeah. it's, I'm just wrapped up in it, you know? And so, like, she got sick and we had to pull her from the fight. And uh, I was like, she's in the, she's in the hotel room just sick as shit. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll be back. <laughs> just, yeah, you just left. He had, we had one of our students with us yeah. and you just left for the fight with one of our students. I was students. like, I'm, I'm taping my own hands. Yeah, it was bad. My student is like, you know, you that that show? what's yeah, that? that? That I was supposed to fight. Uh, that's when I was supposed Tara. to fight Tara. And okay. I got crazy. I got crazy sick. I think it was like food poisoning or something like that. And I just like, I would, I could not move. Like it were, there was no way. Um, and then we ended up rebooking the Tara fight eventually um, yeah. for yeah. Costa Rica. But yeah, yeah that was, <laughs> my head was completely off and i remember yeah. all i remember about the bruno fight is like i went out and i think i took him down right away or early and then we scrambled back to our feet and i remember i was like turtled in the corner and he's punching and kicking or punching and kneeing or something and i i, I don't remember taking any damage and i heard he just the rap respond go, Dude, I heard the ref go activity and I didn't really do anything and they stopped the fight. And I was like, all right, I got to go. It's time to go home. And I remember yeah. like, I remember walking back to the hotel, like this is the most surreal thing I've ever experienced. Like I just, it's like, I needed to go over there. It, it, I don't know. It's like, I showed up cause I said I would, but I just wanted to like, I just wanted to go back. Like yeah. it was really, it was, it was. Yeah. That it, was all bad. Real and bad. fucked up and weird. You know yeah, what I mean? But my head was completely fucked for that fight. Yeah. That was a terrible, that was one, that is one of the fights I am the most ashamed of because I just <laughs> was not present at all. It just wasn't there. You know? Now, Amanda, in, in there, we went, uh, MFC USA versus Russia three, another visit to Atlantic city. And this time, uh, Tara fought Ikano on that card, and you fought Shayna in a rematch. So yeah. we reset the match up in in Costa Rica with this kind of little preview. What do you remember about this show? Well, I think uh, the second fight was Shayna. You mean? Yes. I think I I'm not sure if I'm correct about this, but the at at the very least, the feeling I had about it was. Uh, whoever won that fight, because that was like right before all the Bodog stuff started happening. And right. it kind of had the feeling of, you know, whoever won that fight was going to be the one to be able to go and get that opportunity. Um, I don't know if I just felt that way or if it actually was the case. Uh, so that fight, you know, again, Shane is really good and we were pretty evenly matched. And that's the fight where uh, we ended up doing that third round. You know, so it was like it was back and forth and back and forth, and I got close like to you took the her. first round, she took the second, second and then round. The third round. Yeah. yeah, and then we went out for the the third round, and I don't remember I don't remember much about the third round except that at some point I was able to get on her back when she was in the turtle, and I was just able to land punches um, through uh, through her arms basically, and and got the TKO from that position. On the back. Yep. Yep. So uh, Taro beat uh, Hitomi Akano on that card, yep. and that set you guys up for Costa Rica. Now, at this point, Tara is at kind of coming into her own, you know, because she's she's doing the 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 cowboy hat and the white outfit kind of, and and Tara, who's kind of surly, was starting to get like you know a media smile and and doing interviews and stuff like that. She was kind of feeling. Like a star, how did how did it feel running into her? Um, again, she was, you know, I got along great with her. Um, you know, with the Costa Rica stuff, you know, we had all that uh we had all the extra stuff with all the filming, you know. Yeah. So we would be there days before. So I had more I had more contact with her than you might normally for a regular fight. Um, and it was the same thing, you know, she and I got along great. Um, you know, so it was it was we always had really good luck with that, man. I don't. Yeah, we didn't anybody. really fight too many people. I've only had one really fight that shitty. was like 
I've only had one fight that ever was like bad feelings. Yeah. And I, going into that fight, you know, I felt pretty good. And honestly, I look back at that fight as one of the fights that I'm the proudest of, even though I lost, because I just, I felt like it was a really great fight. Um, and I felt like we both fought really well and kind of close to our potential. And then I just, I made a strategic era at the very, era the at the very end. And she just got on my back and choked me. And I, I never made that mistake again, though. I can tell you that. Like, <laughs> I, I got incredibly good at stopping people from getting around to my back from that turtle position because of that fight. But I still look back at that fight as one of my best fights. Yeah, for sure it was. I, I remember going to a, a, like a meeting afterwards with Bodog people. And I was like, there were like two good fights the whole weekend, you know, and yours was the best fight. And then, you know, one of the guys at Prangley and Uscola kind of drew down and everybody else was kind of on their back foot a little bit. Maybe it's, you know, we were two weeks in Costa Rica. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that has an effect on a lot of stuff. So uh, my hat's off to you, both you and Tara performed better, better than anybody else that weekend. Yeah, I was I was really proud of that fight for both of us. And and it, I was really happy about it as far as uh, for women's MMA, you know, like for us to be able to have a fight like that. I felt like it was just one more step in in getting people to feel like, you know, women's fighting was legitimate. You yeah, felt well, like time I felt like carrying the flag for that, you know? Yeah, yeah I, I felt that that fight was for the number to be the number one girl. I, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think that you got yourself there. Um, you know, Tara, like I said, maybe it was her moment. Um, you never got to rematch her again, but you came back to Bodog a couple of times and got right back on the horse. Yeah. Uh, you know, keep winning and stuff. And you were about to, you know, probably get another title shot. First, uh, Julie Kedzie. Mm -hmm. Was that the Russia one? Yep. That was in, that was one of the Russia ones. Yep. I think we yeah. went to Russia twice, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, yep, Julie Kedzie was one of the Russia ones. Yep. Talk about that uh the the Russia fight because again, now now this is a trip that you know people won't even be able to do anymore, you know, current political landscape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you said you enjoyed it. So why, why don't you give both of you share a little experience from the Russia stuff? Well, Russia was uh, so the first fight in Russia, um we did the same thing that we normally do, you know, when we travel and went to another country where we were really out and about and like trying to see as much of uh, Russia as we could and just see, you know, what was going on. But I have to say, it's probably one of the places uh, I least liked. It was, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very, um, like the pollution was so bad like we would go out walking around and I get back to the hotel and I would blow my nose and literally black stuff would come out from all the exhaust from the cars. It like everybody, like everybody smoked. It's like the, the pollution was just so intense. And on top of that, everybody seemed so unhappy. It was like, like all the people that we'd encounter it, everyone just seemed so, so unhappy. So it was, it was the place I enjoyed the least, even though I, I liked getting to see all of the, all the different things because like the architecture is so different, you know, all of that stuff is so different, yeah. but at the end of the day, it was, you know, it was not that enjoyable of, of experience compared to other places. And the second time I fought in Russia, I actually, we didn't really go out, you know, cause I had already had the experience of what it was like. And we kind of just stayed in the hotel and we didn't really go out and about again because we knew we, we knew what it was like. So we just stayed in and trained and hung out. Jay, at this point, you're kind of taking a step back and, and becoming more of a coach. Is that what's going on here? Because you got, uh, you know, after the Ligori win, you got a couple of fights co coming up, Icon Sport and then Ring of Fire, but nothing – uh, beyond that, was was it a conscious decision, or did you just start kind of running out of uh, options for fights? I mean, it was it was fairly clear that like uh, the big show is not going to happen for me. You know what I mean? Um, okay, that, that's fair. Like it, what's that? I, I mean, it's it's a good assessment for you to make of yourself. 
Well, yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? You can just look at the record or whatever. And I like, I, it never would have worked out for me to be in the UFC. I can't stand Dana White. I can't stand his vibe. I can't stand his attitude. I can't stand the way he talks to fucking fighters. Drives me nuts. And there's no way I would ever tolerate it. And so it's a good thing. It like probably for the best. <laughs> well, I mean, I met him one time backstage at that show in Boston and it just, our first inter- our first meeting did not go well and uh you know that's uh you had, you had already had you were kind of like you know you were kind of show, everything you set out to do like you had you know no no, no i like I, you could do it and it, it was looked just- it looked like it looked like it probably wasn't gonna the ufc looked like it probably wasn't gonna happen i'm in my late 30s do you know what i mean like uh, I, i'm just gonna keep fighting in local shows like you know what i mean like i wanted to know if i could do it i wanted to fight I made all the, like, I, I found out all the things about myself that I needed to find out at that point. It was just to keep something going. Just, you see people do this all the time, man. Like they, they, they should stop fighting and they can't let it go. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you see yeah. these guys that are just like, it's way past, you know? And the only reason they do it is because they get themselves into this thing of like, if I'm not that, what am I? And they can't stop. You know, well, you had the answer to that because you you you're now a coach. You yeah. know, it's tr- I mean, strictly, but you had, um, you know, uh, yeah, you had that answer already for yourself. I think that it seems that way because it was a natural transition. I mean, you're, you're I knew, even when you're I even when I started coach. fighting, man. Even when I started fighting, the truth is one of the one of the things that I carried with me when I started fighting. This was so long ago that it was. You remember back when it was still like to prove jujitsu works, you know what I mean? Like now that's a silly uh, sentiment. Everybody knows it works. But back then it was like, I, I trained martial arts my whole life and I had been uh, sadly disappointed at all the lies that had been told to me. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, just keep punching the fucking Makiwara and keep focusing your chi and keep doing your Kata and it'll all work out. And it's just so much bullshit and that they lied to to students so much that when I started, like I knew when I was five, I wanted to teach martial arts. I've known my entire life. I wanted to be a martial arts teacher. That's all I've ever wanted to do. That's what I was meant for. Like, there's never been a doubt that that was what my life was going to be. So even when I was fighting, it was an offshoot of my teaching. I was fighting to validate the things. I'm not going to teach you something that I don't know firsthand. If I say this will block a punch, I promise you, I can show you video. Like, you know, so mm-hmm. it was uh, at the time validating the reality of the, of the techniques I was learning and working on theories to make sure that what I taught my students was real, you know, um, that's where I started at in the fight world. So it's like, for me, even fighting was an offshoot of teaching. It was never supposed to be the thing but even even with that it still almost fucked me up you know what i mean even though it wasn't my main thing teaching was always my main thing fighting was an offshoot it still got me man like uh, after 10 or 15 years or whatever it was like it still it still got me because when you stop fighting like you don't realize how much of your life goes into because i am fighting like why did you get up and exercise when I, for 20 years before I ever fought professionally, I was working out. I was training. I was hitting the bags. I was sparring. I was rolling. And if somebody said, Hey man, why'd you go lift weights? I'd be like, cause I want to be strong. And why'd you, why do you eat sort of well? Because I want to be fit. And like, why do you train? Cause I like to train. But once you start fighting your answer to every question is because I fight. Like, why didn't you eat that ice cream at the Christmas party? Cause I fight. Why do you run in the morning? Cause I fight. And then when you stop fighting, your brain just kind of goes like, (laughs) like now what dude? And like, even I had another passion that was even greater than fighting and it still rattled me. I ballooned up to like 245 and like super sad. Like I, the only thing that saved my life is that I was still going to the gym. Like if I did not have the gym to go to, and I was forcibly training four or five days a week, just because I have to roll with my students. If I hadn't had that pull to keep me in, like I would have been completely fucked. And I wasn't even, it wasn't even my everything. It was my other thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I know that people that it is their one and true everything 
it's brutal. You know, it's the, yeah. the end. We start telling all of our fighters now, like, haste, <laughs> have other things, prepare for the end from the start. Start thinking about what you're going to do when this is over. Like, don't let yourself turn into that thing because it will go away one day and you got to be able to stand up afterwards, you know? Yeah. That's, that's the athleticism part where, you know, you kind of missed out on that, but like the other sports kind of teach you that, you know, baseball, you know, football, everybody's got a, a shelf life. So, so Amanda, yeah. you got your wins in Bodog there at the end and Bodog fell apart, which is kind of you know, obviously personally a sad thing for me, but um, then you, you kind of got left, out in the cold there well how did you feel like what you know i'm sorry <laughs> but uh you, you, you know how did you feel how come you didn't get back on the horse or or you know what happened to at that point well that's when um that's when it became really hard for me to find fights um you know i mean it was always kind of a challenge but that is when it started to get really difficult um and it was also I mean, I have to say that was a very frustrating experience um, because that's the time period where, you know, I, I did that Bodog fight and I beat Julie Kedzie, um, you know, and it was pretty quick. It wasn't like a long drawn out fight. And that is also the time frame that um, who Showtime was it Showtime? Yeah. That's the also the time frame when Showtime kind of started up with Gina Carano and it was like, that was the beginning of some women being in bigger real shows. And that is the time after that fight is when they, they got Julie Kedzie to fight Gina Carano. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was so disheartening because it was one of those things where I, I felt like it was very much, they were looking for somebody oh, wow. that looked a certain way. Um, and you know, of course, back then I still had my short spiky hair and I had these tattoos and I, like, I was not, I was not the you were way too much for person. fucking showtime at that point. Yeah. I was, I was like the alternative, whatever. And it was just very disheartening to have gone in and beat this person. Um, you know, not like it Thousand. wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was very disheartening to then have that happen and then have her get that opportunity when I had just beat her. Um, yeah. So that was really frustrating. And uh, that's also when it became super hard for me to find fights. Dana so, was on record at the time of saying no women would ever fight in the UFC. Yeah. Showtime was blocking her out because she didn't have the look and she wouldn't change her stance on that. And Bodog and all the other shows Bodog fell apart, up. which was a so real like, bummer. She was yeah. in her late thirties. She's starting to deal with a bunch of injuries. It looks like the big show's not going to have women. The other stand-in that's trying to be the big show isn't going to invite her. What are we going to do in her late thirties? Go back and fight at a fucking VFW for five hundred bucks? Like we just yeah. went and had dinner with Putin, and we're going to go back and fight in a fucking auditorium at a church again? You know? Yeah. And Did you guys get to go to the dinner with, with Vladimir? T talk about that experience. I, I I've heard various uh, stories there. Uh, I did. So that, that was the crazy thing. And uh, you might remember this about, about Jay. I don't know, but so we did, especially when we were in other countries, like we really didn't like it when they made us separate. Um, and so that was one of those weird things where like Jay wasn't allowed to come. Like they just took the fighters. So at, right after that show, all the fighters got put on a bus, but like our corners, you know, and our coaches or whatever, they couldn't come. So that, I didn't like that part. And it was, I didn't really know what was happening. It wasn't, it wasn't presented really as like a choice. Like, do you want to go or do you not want to go? It's like, we all just were going on the bus. Um, and I didn't even really know where we were going or why. Well, they said you were going to dinner. And I was like, cool, that's awesome. You get a chance to have dinner with Putin. That's fucking cool. Go have yeah. dinner. It, 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 was, like, it was one of those very surreal experiences. Um, just to in the morning, like, they're like, know? palace and like jean-claude van damme was there and it was like <laughs> I, it was just very it was just very surreal you know surreal. it was crazy yeah but that was uh, like really a frustrating time period because it was essentially like all signs pointed to being the end of the career as in we're not going to go down and start taking little bitty shows for shitty money and worse opponents 
UFC says they're not going to have women. Showtime's not interested. They're only booking every once in a while fights and they're only taking girls that look like prom queens or whatever. And then it was like, well, it looks, and she also had knee surgery at the time, a couple of knee surgeries in a row. And yeah, it was well, like, there was oh. one, I finally got a fight. I don't even remember who it was or what the promotion was, but I finally, after a, a long stretch, I finally got a fight and I was so pumped up to finally get one. Yep. And I was sparring with one of our guys that, you know, fought at, he was my main training partner actually. Um, and I was sparring with him and I tore my ACL. Like I, I felt it immediately. And so then I had to have ACL surgery. So then you're out, you know, that's six months yeah. Yeah. Um, before you can come back from that. So it just, it just was one of those things. Like I didn't get to decide to retire, um, which made it a little bit hard. It was almost like, I still desperately wanted to fight. Like if it was up to me, I'd like to fight until I dropped dead. Don't um, you remember like, it was that whole thing. And we just kind of like, well, it looks like the cards are saying, don't fight. Like you've had a couple surgeries, can't find opponents. You're late thirties. It looks like this is when we stop. Right. And so we just kind of begrudgingly accepted it. And then fucking Rhonda goes to the UFC and we're like, holy shit. Like now there's a possibility of UFC. Do we make a comeback? What's going on? And then they put uh, the women in the tough house. Yeah. Right. And, and we were like, bro, this is I tried to let's do that. go let's fucking go like let's go and we contacted and I, got, I got turned down because they said that i was over the age limit she was 37 <laughs> and they said fuck the spike or whatever was cutting it off at 35 so we sat in the house watching all these girls that mandy had beaten if not hung with and like <laughs> incredibly frustrating and then we're like okay that's the end the ending of her career was one of the most incredibly fucking frustrating endings to any athletic career I've ever seen. It was, it was brutal to watch. Yeah, it was, it was horrible. And I'm sorry it went that way. It has all the ugly makings of, you know, just sort of like, you know, nowadays it's hard to have a, a normal conversation with people about, you know, uh, politics and things like that. But here's a, a thing where they're judging you on something completely besides your in-ring skill. And that's, oh yeah. That's yeah. fair, you know. <laughs> we're told by a number like, of promoters I, back then. We were told by feel, a number of promoters. I do feel like that has changed. That is one thing that's changed a little bit now because you do see, um, you know, a lot more alternative looking women um, getting shots, you yeah. know, and getting opportunities. And so even though I didn't get to benefit from it, like I'm, I'm glad to see that that has happened because it was absolutely, you know, when I was fighting, it was absolutely a factor. Um, yeah. you know, I for sure didn't get some opportunities because I chose to have like such an alternative appearance. So that was very frustrating. Yeah. It's, and like I said, I, I, you know, every, everybody has their own prejudices and stuff like that, but I, I firmly stand by the fact that from that era, easily you're a top three, you know, f fighter from that era, especially when you consider skill, you, the, the record. Not so much, but in terms of the sheer talent and obviously the mindset and everything you bought, um, you elevated the game. And now there are people uh, more similar to you and things like that that are, are making it. And that's, you know, you deserve credit for that, too, because to be really the only alternative like you. There, I can't think of too many other girls that didn't go the, no, the kind no, of I like, can't. you know, I I'm trying to be no. feminine because that contrast makes it. And. Yeah. You know, you're definitely, so you're a pioneer in more ways than one. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Unfortunately, I, you know, during that time period, it was, it was uh, detrimental to me. Um, but it just, it wasn't something I was willing to compromise on, you know. So I just, I just accepted, you know, what that meant for me. Um, but I, I am very happy to see that that, that part has changed at least a little bit for women that are fighting now. Yeah. yeah. Jay, uh, so talk about one, you know, uh amanda you're originally from maine is, how I, does it... I i grew up in maine so i i mean i kind of say i'm from maine but i i was born in florida we lived in a couple different states and then my family moved to maine when i was in sixth grade and i i lived in maine from then all the way till i graduated from college um so that that's where the majority of my growing up was done jj how's the adjustment to maine i, I snowy just like the rockies and so I was born and raised in Louisiana and okay. then 
moved yeah. to Colorado for a bunch of years and then moved to Maine. So it was like a slow cooling process. Like I went, you know what I mean? Like a little bit of cold and then to Maine. Yeah. But the truth is, man, everywhere in the world kind of looks the same to me. Like I don't really do anything. Like I go to the gym, like it's always 70 and sunny in the gym. You know what I mean? So like my yeah. life, my, when Mandy's like, I want to move to Maine, I'm like, all right, because Hawaii, Maine, fucking Alaska, Australia, every place looks the same. It's mats and a ceiling. Like it's all the same to me. Do you know what I mean? So like, I'm, very, I'm a simple guy. I'm very easy to, very easy to get along with. You know what I mean? If I've got her, I've got my dogs, I've got mats. Now it's a motorcycle. I got to have, like, if I have some basic things, I'm set. I'm good. I don't care. I'm good. I'll follow her to the moon. Yeah, he's, he's very easy like that. <laughs> That's cool because you guys, you know, you always, it, it, it's, you know, it's a very firm relationship because sometimes that coach, you know, they, they call it a coach teacher relationship. And that's part of, of what you guys have. And the fact that you're still together and, and things like that makes for an incredible story and, and a real martial arts story. I think if anybody's in the main area, they should uh, contact the school. Why don't you give the, the school a little plug and, and things like that as well here as we wrap up. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> this is the funny thing. Like, we are we are so bad at like business related stuff oh, it's yeah. like the running joke yeah. like we we do none of the stuff that you're supposed to do when you have a business um Dude, we moved into just... a brand new location two years ago like a year and a half two years ago we have oh. not plugged the landline in like yeah. it just, we don't, we it just never got plugged in but yeah the the website is the academy um the name of the gym is the academy uh People can uh, get in touch with us on Facebook or um, the Academy Maine at gmail.com. Um, and we, you know, our gym is very much, uh, it's kind of unique these days because of what's happened with jujitsu. So many places now are like sport oriented and the standards have gone down so low as far as promotions and belts and stuff like that. We have stayed the same. So we have really intense testing that people have to go through. Like we, it still takes people about 10 years to get a black belt from us. Um, and we're very much based in real world stuff still. So everything, you know, our basic curriculum is, is still very much based in people being able to defend themselves in real life situations. And then if somebody wants to get into sport, you know, we can do that, but we, that, that's our, uh, that is our core philosophy is that everything is geared towards like real life. Um, so if you're in Maine and you're interested in that type of training, definitely it would be good to stop by. Yeah, the quality people, you know, we just spent two hours talking about their career in MMA. Um, really, uh, at the highest level, a lot of, you know, and at the ground level, too, both both kind of peaks and balances and stuff. And I think we shared a lot of great stories. I knew we would. And uh, definitely great to catch up with you guys. Jay, Thank always you. my respect. And Amanda, uh, like we said, a pioneer in more ways than one. And I have to, and just to say to you, Miguel, also, you were one of the promoters, you know, in our very small list of promoters that we like to deal with and tried to deal with, like you were on that list, you know, so you were always the one that, you know, we dealt with for all that Bodog stuff. And you were one of the people that we always felt comfortable dealing with because we knew we weren't going to get screwed over. We knew you weren't going to screw us over with trying to do like fucked up, you know, matchups or something like that. So we yeah, always really you know, out around every once in a while, you know, throw an extra round in there in overtime every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we, we really always appreciated, you know, having, uh, having, you be a stand-up promoter that we could deal with. So, you know, we have to give credit to you also. And a lot of the women's MMA that exists today came, was, from, came from the fact that that directly, not just a bunch of people, but directly you through the hook and shoot and through fucking, you know, Bodog, Bodog and through and all, all the matches stuff. that you made, like you had a big part of that. Uh, it wouldn't be where it is without you. So. Yeah. I appreciate that too. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I think it, it was a job we were trying to do. Every, you know, everybody had something to contribute, trying to put this thing on the map because it's definitely was something worthwhile. Yeah. And uh, I thank you both. You guys were both early practitioners that understood that, that were 
reaching for a higher level all the time. So thank you yeah. very much. It showed. All right. Well, thank you, Miguel. It was great to talk with you and catch up. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for coordinating Amanda for me and Jay. We've been yeah. talking about this for a while. Couldn't get it off the ground until you yeah. got coordinate with me, bro. I'm yeah, terrible. I got I handle all that stuff. So yeah, yeah I was I was glad we got it figured out. So that was great. All right, we've been going over two hours. So thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect. Peace. All right, thanks, Mel. Bye. Bye.